For those in attendance who wish to listen and participate in Spanish, please select the globe icon in your control bar and select your preferred language. Muy buenas noches para las personas que quisieran escuchar esta reunión en español. Por favor, haga clic en el icono del globo que se encuentra al pie de la página y elija el idioma español. Si quiere hacer un comentario en español o una pregunta, se la vamos a interpretar al inglés. Gracias. Welcome to the City Council's June 6th Special City Council Meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers in accordance with public health guidelines for in-person meetings and participating remotely to promote social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Jen Willison, City Council members Drew Combs, and Ray Mueller, City Council member Cecilia Taylor will be participating remotely. Staff present include Interim City Manager Justin Murphy, City Attorney Nira Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Nash. And again, echoing a welcome to our June 6 special meeting. For members of the public who are wish to speak on an item that is on tonight's agenda, after the mayor calls for public comment on that item, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. You can also press star nine when calling in from a landline or a cell phone. And that concludes my introductions at this time. Thank you. Study session. Study sessions are an opportunity for city staff to introduce an item that will require policy direction from the city council in the near future. City staff will provide a brief presentation. I will then call for public comment. After public comment, the city council will discuss the matter interactively with staff. The city council will not take an action on items addressed in study sessions. The city council may provide direction to city staff for preparation of additional analysis or information necessary when the item returns to the City Council for action. The study session item is C1, review and provide feedback on the draft City of Menlo Park sixth cycle 2023 to 2031 housing element. City Clerk Karen, could you please call for public comment to get an estimate of the number of speakers on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, we do ask that if you wish to provide public comment on tonight's study session item uh, regarding the housing element following the presentation, um, we ask that you do engage that hand feature at this time or press star nine if you're calling in, uh, just so we can gauge the amount of speakers that we have for this item. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Assistant Community Development Director, Deanna Chow. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Nash and members of the City Council. I'm Deanna Chow, Assistant Community Development Director, and here with me this evening are members of our Housing Element Update team, including Tom Smith and Calvin Chan from City Staff, and Jeff Bradley, Sun Kwan, and Asher Cohn from the M Group. We are here this evening for a study session on the draft housing element, which is currently available for a 30 day public review period. The comment period ends this Friday, June 10th. We are excited to have reached this important milestone in this process. As part of this study session, we are seeking feedback from the public and guidance from the city council on key topics, such as site inventory and policies and programs. This information will be used to help prepare a revised draft housing element, which will be submitted to the state housing and community development department who will have 90 days to review the draft document and provide comments. To provide an overview of the housing element and items for the city council's consideration, I'm pleased to introduce Asher Cohn of the M Group who will be providing a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm gonna share the presentation. Good evening, council members and members of the public. My name is Asher Cohn. I'm a planner with M Group. We've been working on the housing element with the city. I'm gonna walk you through this presentation on the public review draft housing element. First, I'm gonna give some background on the housing element process. Then I will review the Housing Commission Planning Commission study session that took place on May 16th. 
After that, I'll describe the structure of the draft document in the site inventory before giving an overview of the goals, policies, and programs, and then talk about next steps. To begin, some background. This housing element is required by the state. Menlo Park is required in the next eight years after housing element certification from 2023 to 2031 to plan for accommodating the regional housing needs allocation arena of 2,946 units. We at M Group began this process with the city approximately one year ago. We've done considerable outreach throughout this process and you can read more about it on the website at the bottom of the screen, menlopark.org slash housing element. We've had council meetings, two project galleries in Menlo Park's libraries, held pop-up meetings in the community, put out social media messages, met with focus groups, and sent out citywide mailers. We've also held meetings with the community, with CEOC, sent out a community survey, and gone to Housing Commission and Planning Commission meetings. Now we are in the public review period, which began on May 11th. We held a study session with the Housing Commission and Planning Commission a few weeks ago, and tonight we're doing the same with City Council. At the end of the week, the public review period will close, and we will update the public review draft to address the comments we've received. We've already received over 50 comments, not including what we gathered on the May 16th study session. Once we have an updated draft document, we will send it to the, we will send it to the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, who will have 90, 90 days for the initial review period. At that May 16th study session, the commissioners expressed general support for the direction of the document. Um, they identified several programs that would benefit from shorter implementation timelines. H2D, Accessory Dwelling Unit, ADU, Amnesty Program. H2E, the Anti-Displacement Strategy. H4O, Identifying SB10 Sites. H4E, Ministerial Review of 100% Affordable Housing, H7A, Create Residential Design Standards. Additional comments are available in Attachment F, and that also includes responses from city staff. Now, let us go over the structure and content of the Public Review Draft Housing Element. There are nine chapters in the housing element plus the appendices. These chapters are introduction, fifth cycle housing element review, housing conditions and trends, affir affirmatively furthering fair housing, actual and potential constraints to housing, energy, site inventory and analysis, goals, policies and programs, and definitions of key housing terms. The next few slides will hit on some of the highlights of these chapters. For the fifth cycle review, we evaluate the accomplishments of the previous cycle, which goes from 2015 to 2023. We identified policy and program changes from the fifth cycle for the sixth cycle, which goes from 2023 to 2031. Housing conditions and trends looks at housing data and forecasts. For example, we have seen housing values grow in the city, even compared to the county and the region. This has made purchasing a home out of reach for many working and middle-class families. From a geographic perspective, the state classifies census tracts as high, moderate, or low resource areas, and notes that the low resource areas is where there is often high segregation and poverty. These terms are defined by the state treasurer, and they're broadly understood by the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, as ways to determine where access to health, educational opportunities and economic mobility is located. In Menlo Park, the white population is disproportionately located in high resource areas and the Hispanic population is disproportionately located in low resource areas. Turning our attention to the site inventory, we can see what this looks like from a numbers perspective. In orange at the top is the regional housing needs allocation for Menlo Park. HCD recommends a 30% buffer. We put this buffer number in green. We can take credit for pipeline projects 
that is housing developments that are underway and ADU projections to take care of our above moderate unit allocation and, um, and a substantial amount of our affordable unit allocation. So we're left with needing to find sites to accommodate 1,469 units. The vast majority of our pipeline projects are in Council District 1 on the north side of US 101. Therefore, our first focus was to, was to distribute sites through Council Districts 2 through 5. And as you might recall from a few slides ago, the high highest resource areas in Menlo Park are south of US 101. This means we're putting the bulk of our 1,469 affordable units in high resource areas, which is a huge plus from HCD's perspective. We assessed all of the parcels based on criteria laid out by HCD, including site size and what sort of social resources, such as public transit, open space, groceries, and schools it was in walking distance of. As we narrow down this list of sites, we emphasize identifying sites near multiple resources. For each of our 73 sites, we just developed site sheets with important information on them, including this AFFH score, which shows how many social resources the site was near. The maximum AFFH score is seven. Since publishing these sites earlier this year, we have updated considerations on several sites in the city. We are gonna discuss these considerations tonight on the following sites. A, Marsh Bohannon sites. B, Sharon Heights Office Park sites. C, Stanford site. D, St. Bede's. E, Menlo Church site. F, former flood school site. G, USGS site. H, SRI Park Line and I Civic Center. The next few slides will go over these sites in a bit more detail. Going from north to south in the city, we'll start with the Marsh Bohannon sites, A, and the former flood school site, F. The property owner of the Marsh Bohannon sites stated disinterest in housing development unless higher densities were considered. There were a few sites in Council District 2 and a desire to spread housing opportunity throughout the city. Council could potentially direct to keep sites on the opportunity sites list and increase densities, which is staff's recommendation, keep the, keep the site on the list with the AHO bonus or remove the sites from the list. The former flood school site has seen concerns raised by neighbors. However, it is the only vacant site in Menlo Park with express property owner interests and developer interests for affordable housing. Uh, council could potentially direct to keep the site on the list, but limit density and not apply the AHO overlay, um, which staff recommends. Keep the site on the opportunity sites list or remove the site from the list. Next set of sites are the Menlo Church sites, E, USGS, uh, G, SRI Parkline, H, and Civic Center. The Menlo Church site's owner, the Church of the Pioneers Foundation, stated they were disinterested in housing development on these parcels. However, plans can change and retaining the sites would allow more options and or potential. Council could potentially direct to remove the sites from the opportunity site list, which staff recommends, or keep the sites on the list. The USGS site is currently up for sale. An increased housing allowance could incentivize a housing developer to participate in a bid to develop housing on the site. Council could potentially direct to keep the site on the list and increase densities on the site, which staff recommends. Keep the site on the opportunity site list with an AHO bonus or remove the site from the list. SRI Parkline is listed as a pipeline project, so it is not on the site inventory. It is counted towards RENA as a development proposal. The project currently calls for approximately 400 residential units in a 10 acre residential zone. Staff recommends council direct to keep Parkline as a pipeline project and consider potential for more units. The applicant is proposing a study of variant as part of the environmental review process, which could include up to 600 dwelling units on the site. City council has previously provided direction to not consider the Civic Center as a potential housing site. However, some housing and planning commissioners and some members of the public express interest in using the site for housing. Council could potentially direct to not include 
the site on the site inventory, that is make no change, which is staff's recommendation, or could add a new program to consider housing at Civic Center. Lastly, there are three sites at issue in Sharon Heights. Um, Sharon Heights Office Parks, B. Um, sorry, a Stanford owned site at Rural Lane, C. And St. Bede's, D. The owner of the Sharon Heights Office Park stated they were disinterested in housing development on these parcels. However, plans can change and retaining the sites would allow more options and or potential. In addition, there are limited sites in District 5 and a desire to spread housing opportunity throughout the city. Council could potentially direct to remove the sites from the opportunity sites list, which staff recommends, or keep the sites on the list. The owner of Site C stated the site had constraints such as drainage and accessibility that is impacted by Stanford golf course and operations. However, plans can change and retain the sites would also allow more of options and a potential and the issues at the site could potentially be addressed during site planning. Council could potentially direct to remove the site from the opportunity site list, which staff recommends, or keep the sites on the list. Finally, the property owner of site D say they're disinterested in housing development. The site serves as a school, so the, property, so the parking needs and hours are different from a church only site. Um, similarly though, plans can change or retain the sites would again, allow for more options and or potential. Council could potentially direct to remove the sites from the opportunity site list, which staff recommends or keep the sites on the list. So there are two overarching questions which we have for council tonight. First is with consideration to state law and guidance by the Menlo Park community, does the site inventory represent an appropriate inventory of land suitable for residential development, including vacant sites and sites having the potential for redevelopment? Second, are there particular potential housing opportunity sites that should be explored for addition, modification, such as to increase density or removal? And finally, we will discuss housing goals and policies. First, an overview on how the goals and policies are laid out. There are housing goals, which are overarching housing objectives for Menlo Park to strive for. These goals are supported by policies, which are approaches that move the city towards its goals. Finally, there are housing programs, which are concrete steps that enact a policy and accomplish goals. The overarching intent of the housing element is to create a balanced community with a focus on affordability that will forward social justice. The existing fifth cycle from 2015 to 2023 has four goals. The six cycle housing element we are working on has seven proposed goals. The policies that undergird these goals come from a variety of sources, including community outreach findings, issues identified in fair housing, site specific programs, policies to reduce the constraints to housing, and the Association of Bay Area Governments Resilience Housing Pro Policies. To give an overview of these goals and what they entail, we have them on two slides. Goal one, implementation responsibilities, continue to build local government institutional capacity and monitor accomplishments to effectively respond to housing needs. Goal two, existing housing and neighborhoods, equitably maintain, protect and enhance existing housing and neighborhoods while also supporting quality schools, city services and infrastructure. Goal three, Specialized housing needs. Provide housing for special needs populations that is coordinated with special with support services. Goal four, affordable housing. Support the development of diversity of housing types for people at all income levels, particularly for extremely low, very low, and low income households. Goal five, equity. Ensure equitable house access to housing. Goal six, sustainable housing, implement sustainable and resilient housing development practices. Goal seven, design of housing, ensure new housing is well designed and address the housing needs of the city. Goal one, implementation responsibilities is largely carried over from the current housing element. It includes policies to coordinate with regional and interjurisdictional efforts, 
utilize and advertise BMR funds, augment local funding, increase organizational effectiveness, including evaluating staff capacity, coordinate with nonprofits on housing, and monitor housing, monitor the housing element. Goal two, existing housing in neighborhoods is also largely carried over. It includes policies such as an ordinance for at-risk units to provide housing rehabilitation outreach and funding, adopt an ADU amnesty ordinance, and to develop anti-displacement strategy with the community. Goal three, specialized housing needs has some policies carried over from the current housing element, but also some new ones. It includes policies to encourage linking supportive services to housing, incentivize successful and special needs housing, publicize rental assistance programs, allow low barrier navigation centers in residential mixed use areas, and for a regional collaboration to address homelessness. Goal four, affordable housing, is another with some policies carried over and some new policies. It includes policies to rezone for higher, higher housing densities near downtown, allow ministerial review of 100% affordable housing, modifications to affordable housing overlay, convert, 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 commercial, convert commercial to mixed use, apologies, mod to consider modifications to the below market inclusionary requirement in lieu fees, uh, to modify parking requirements and uh, surrounding ADUs. Goal five, equity, also has some policies carried over from the current housing element and many new policies. This includes policies to ensure equal housing opportunity, to require community participation and planning, to identify opportunities for home ownership, for multilingual information and housing programs, and to provide tenant support and protection programs, including a fair chance ordinance. And note here on the fair chance ordinance, this is something that does allow screening out of individuals with criminal histories for rental applications. Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Richmond all have some sort of fair chance law, as do several cities outside of the Bay Area. Goal six, sustainable housing, is another with a mix of carryover and new policies. These policies include renewable energy to encourage renewable energy and conservation implement walking and biking improvements, and to promote resilient design and air conditioning alternatives. And finally, goal seven, design of housing, is also one with a mix of carryover and new policies. These policies include developed residential design standards and objective design standards for SB9 projects. There are two large questions we have for council to discuss regarding housing goals and policies. First, with consideration to state law, AFFH requirements, and guidance by the Menlo Park community, do the goals, policies, and programs of the draft housing element reflect an appropriate plan for housing in Menlo Park between 2023 and 2031? And second, are the implementation timeframes for proposed housing programs appropriate? Um, I should add here that attachment H includes a chart, a chart showing the implementation targets for programs in the housing element. So with all that said, let's look at a quick snapshot of where we are in the process and what's next. The 30-day public review period began on May 11th. At the end of June and into July, HCD will review the draft housing element. At the same time, the draft subsequent environmental impact report, or SEIR, will be circulated. From July and into October, HCD will conclude the review of the draft housing element. Also in the fall, the safety and environmental justice elements will be ready for public review. The safety element requires 30-day Department of Conservation review, and no review period by any state body is required for the environmental justice element. Also during this time frame, we will see the final SEIR published. By the end of the year, the SEIR is on track to be certified and the housing element will be adopted along with associated zoning ordinance amendments. The housing element will be submitted to HCD 
uh, later approved. And uh, we should note that these dates are tentative and this is all subject to modification as you go forward. And where we are today, the public review draft is up on the city's website. Again, that's menlopark.org slash housing element. There's an online web form to provide comments up there. And uh, this form closes on Friday, June 10th. In addition, we'll take notes of the comments made tonight. So thank you so much for listening this evening. We're gonna turn it over to you for questions. I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen, but I'll have everything available for reference um, upon council's request. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. City Clerk Karen, how many public speakers do we have on this item? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So thank you for the folks who have already engaged your hands. You are in queue. I just wanted to make an additional call for any public comment on our study session item C1 related to our housing element. You can engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen or press star nine if you're calling in, be most appreciative. Mayor Nash, I am seeing approximately 11 uh, speakers at this time. Thank you. Um, given the number of public speakers, I think we will continue with the three minute limit. Thank you, Thank you Mayor Nash. All right, so our first speaker will be Francesca Serge, followed by Catherine. Hey, um, I hope you can hear me, yes? Okay, I didn't expect to be first in line, but that's really very nice. Um, um, I just wanna thank, first of all, all of you for doing this tremendous work. Um, trying to clear the path to bring more housing, especially affordable housing into Menlo Park. I understand you are doing everything to comply with state law, I get that. Um, and I think a more diverse residential base is going to bring more vibrancy to this community. So yay for that. Um, I am a member of the school board, but I am speaking tonight as a resident. And I just wanna let you know that I looked at the draft element and um, looking forward to new residents and more dense housing. Um, and I just wanna make sure that the residents who move in, especially those with children, have access to the same high quality education and low class sizes that MPCSD currently offers. So I would like to see the school district and the city partner on creating this vibrant community. Um, and to that end, I was slightly disappointed with some of the language um, from the previous housing element that was more supportive of the school, some of that language was removed or modified in this draft element. So I was disappointed to see that that supportive language for schools seems to have been removed or modified. Um, so I would like to see that supportive language from the previous housing element stay intact. Um, I'd like to see some community amenities earmarked for schools moving forward. Um, teachers and staff prioritized in getting access to some of those units that are, are affordable. And um, would love to see the city help the district to identify real estate um, should our, our, our student body expand to the point that we do need to create um, new campuses. So those are my thoughts on the schools. And then just in terms of opportunity sites, I'm not sure what's happening at 989 El Camino. It's the mini mall where the Mama Chelly's is in the bar three, but I didn't see that on the list somehow. And I thought, well, why not? That seemed like a great location. And then other than that, I wanna make sure that um, everything you guys are doing is looking, supporting sustainability measures and um, active transportation. And um, I really think you're gonna, you're gonna do a great job and I really appreciate your hard work and um, Please keep looking out for the students and the schools and the future of Menlo Park. That's all I've got for you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Catherine, followed by Verl Ebby. And Catherine, if you wouldn't mind stating your last name for the record. Yes, it's uh, Catherine Dumont. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks to the council and the planners, uh, all the hard work. Um, I'm still going through the ele housing element, uh, but um, just um, comments on the um, the feedback um, tonight um, is, uh, you know, the general uh, trend I would hope would be to increase base density um, uh, allowed, especially uh, for building near uh, services and transit and also increasing um, developer fees to be in line with those of neighboring uh, cities. Um, regarding the flood site, I'm really disappointed to hear that there's a consideration to lower the density and um, perhaps uh, remove the housing overlay. So um, I, I, I think that um, that's very short-sighted um, uh, and, and um, not just to dismiss concerns about parking and traffic, but um, um, having lived near um, several large construction sites in Stanford, not, none of the concerns that the neighbors had about the parking and traffic were as bad as, as we all feared um, at the time. Um, and then I think that the um, Civic Center um, should be added to consideration, especially the, um, given that um, so many of these projects, um, these sites, um, uh, the owners have um, indicated they're not interested in, in uh, development for, for housing. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, Civic Center and the downtown. Um, I think the downtown areas, the the, own, the city owned uh, spaces downtown should be um, considered parking lots. And um, I think we could uh, do some really good um, housing in that area close to services and, and transit, um, especially for seniors, special needs people, and um, those who work uh, in the downtown area as providing services to the greater community, um, such as those who work at um, Starbucks and Trader Joe's and the local restaurants that keep us all um, happy and, and well fed. So I guess that's all the time I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Verl Ebby, followed by Superintendent Burmeister. Uh, hi. Uh this is Verl Abbey. I'm a longtime resident of Menlo Park. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to provide some input and also appreciate all of the hard work by the Planning Commission Council, other the, uh, the staff to develop this. So I have two sets of comments. One is on the opportunity sites, and it's really just a specific question uh, that maybe the council can, can uh, consider. Site number 51 on the list is the Guild Theater, which was just remodeled, as you know. I think they spent over $30 million, it's a tenth of an acre site. Yet across the street from the Guild Theater, not on the list, is uh, the Cornerstone Research Building, which I understand is on a piece of a parcel of land that's owned by the city of Menlo Park. And so my question would be to the council as to why, why is that building or that lot, that parcel not on the list because it's certainly an ideal location in terms of proximity to Caltrain city services. It's really as good as it can get. So that's a question as to why the Guild Theater's on it. I'm sure the owners of that don't plan on redeveloping it for housing after just uh, you know bringing it up and running. So the other area I'd like to comment on is really a more of a policy area, and that's really on the ADU production that's assumed in the element. It seems that it's quite low. I saw recently that Woodside's targeting 200 ADUs in their plan. You know, whether or not that finally gets approved, I don't know, but it seems that we could strive for more ADUs. 
because they're certainly spread across the city, which would be an, a good equity thing in all of the districts. And one of the things that I think you have, I haven't had a chance to read all of it, and I don't know exactly the plans, but I think that you should consider greatly reducing the fees charged by the city to uh, get an ADU, a building permit for an ADU. And just quickly, I'll comment that my wife and I are in the process of getting a new retirement home built in the R3 district. We have a detached ADU. And so far, the building department fees are about the same for the 2,700 square foot house as a 700 square foot ADU. And I think that that's, you know, not, you know, not really the way the city should be going. You know, maybe we could consider using some of the bonus money that we get from developers to uh, subsidize the plan reviews of ADUs to encourage more ADUs throughout the city, you know, and other means. Uh, I think that would be a, a good thing. One quick example before my time runs out, the geologist uh, review of the soils report, I was charged uh, $1,200 for the house and $1,200 to review the exact same report on a 7,400 square foot house for the detached ADU. Seems uh, a bit extravagant. Uh, the building department said that I should bring it up with council. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Superintendent Burmeister, followed by Lauren Bigelow. Thank you. On behalf of the Menlo Park City School District, I want to extend our gratitude to the city staff, electeds, and partners who've participated in the development of this lengthy and thoughtful document. We also want to extend our appreciations, appreciation to the dozens of engaged citizens who've provided input on the process, especially those who've highlighted the challenges that the proposed and required development will have on MPCSD schools. I want everybody to remember that MPCSD recognizes that the housing element update speaks primarily to the housing infrastructure and plans to bring the housing to fruition. We understand and have been told by city council members and staff that the documents that will specifically address the impacts the housing will have um, and the proposals to mitigate those impacts will be a part of the environmental and fiscal impact reports. As a reminder, we support expanded housing development. We particularly recognize the challenges that face our elected officials and staff to meet the expectations of the state and to address housing supply and inequity. Our district looks forward to educating all the children that the future housing development welcomes to our community. We also want to remind the city council that MPCSD has no land to build additional capacity uh, uh, to build um, and to provide additional capacity and our current sites are already near or at capacity. It is only through partnership and creative problem solving that the city and school district will be able to ensure that quality schools continue to be a hallmark of the Menlo Park community. It is because of this necessary partnership that we're disappointed in the suggested removal of the few references to the impacts on schools that the update is proposing to cut in the current draft. Examples include on pages 49 through 51, 85 through 87, and page 116. While I understand the inability of M Group and the city to respond tonight to questions from the public, I would hope that M Group and city staff would address the obvious question. In light of all the input imploring the city to address the needs of schools and their planning, why exactly are the few references to schools suggested to be removed? Beyond a proposed addition on page 333 that the city work to coordinate demographic and school district needs, the update appears relatively silent on the issue of schools. In light of the modification and removal of the few references on the impacts of schools, it is our expectation that the subsequent environmental and fiscal impact report will detail the specific and wide ranging challenges that the city and school district must address together in order to meet the needs of the proposed housing, as well as specific plans the city intends to take to increase the school's capacity to educate the students the housing will generate. This week, our school district will be publishing a schools and housing one pager to highlight four very specific requests of the city as it pursues the implementation of the housing element. I look forward to hearing and understanding the city council and city staff's uh, feedback on our four very reasonable requests and we continue to look forward uh, in partnering with you on solving these difficult but surmountable problems. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Lauren Bigelow, followed by Kalisha Webster.
Good evening, council members. My name is Lauren Bigelow and I'm chair of the Housing Commission, but tonight I am here to speak as a resident of District 5. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. For the past seven years, I worked in affordable housing on the peninsula, at the government level creating policy, at the nonprofit level in direct services, and also administering programs. So I have an understanding of the subject matter from several different viewpoints. I get it. This work is really hard, and 708 pages is a lot. I know, and thank you for your service, truly. In the past three years that I have been appointed to and served on the Housing Commission, we have lost our entire housing department. Yes, times have been tough. It is no excuse. The notion that we continue to create a workplace that does not support the staff of the single largest issue impacting our region is outrageous. I am delighted to see the breadth of ideas and sites in the housing element, but there is absolutely no way that this work can be done if we do not create an environment that staff want to stay and work in. As the presentation noted, the housing element is a requirement by the state. It is the bare minimum of what we need to do. We need to go further, both in terms of our housing our community and in terms of our housing staff. I believe that densification along transit corridors can be done intelligently and beautifully, as has been shown repeatedly across our region. To do so significantly works towards our sustainability goals by making public transit the easy choice and diminishes our greenhouse gas emissions. The same could be said for many of our city owned properties, including but not limited to utilizing smaller pieces of the Simbic Center to construct affordable housing for our seniors, low income families and community members with disabilities. We say that we want this community to be inclusive. So let's make it easier to create housing at every income level and support our most vulnerable residents. But building is not the only thing we need to do, as is pointed out by California's Housing and Community Development Department's mandate that we affirmatively further fair housing. We need to make sure that we keep our renters in their homes, which is incidentally one of the most cost efficient mechanisms for combating homelessness and stabilizing our community. This leaves quite a few places to focus our very limited resources. The metrics that are called out sporadically through the document are excellent. I would recommend that any policy or program we discuss include not only these metrics, but also have enforcement and implementation milestones baked in. It's important that we can easily track progress throughout the entire housing cycle. Thank you again. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Kalisha Webster, followed by Marcella Ramos. Uh, good evening. My name is Kalisha Webster. I'm senior housing advocate at Housing Choices. We are a service provider funded by the Golden Gate Regional Center to help people with developmental disabilities who want to live independently in their community to um, find and retain affordable housing. We did just call in to thank staff and consultant um, for incorporating the comments that we have um, we have uh, submitted in the community engagement process as required for the analysis of residents with disabilities, as well as some of our recommended policies and programs to increase production of inclusive and accessible housing. Um, one thing I did kind of want to clarify, I think there's some confusion in that analysis of how our comments should inform that analysis overall of the broader disabled community. Um, so we work specifically with people with developmental disabilities. Um, unfortunately, the analysis incorrectly defines developmental disability as attributable to, attributable to a physical or mental impairment. And it asserts that the data we provided for the Department of Developmental Services um, reflects the needs of all persons with disabilities. Um, and so to, to uh, clarify, a developmental disability is a substantial who, sorry, the person with a developmental disability who is eligible for DDS funded services um, that Housing Choices provides is attributable to a substantial disability in cognitive and so, or social functioning. Um, so not necessarily physical or mental impairment, that can be a dual diagnosis, um, but that data does not encompass all people with disabilities. Um, and it specifically does not include disabilities that are solely physical, solely psychiatric or solely learning disabilities. Um, a lot of the housing needs of persons with disabilities overall do overlap, but it's important to understand that housing accessibility needs 
can be very specific for different types of disabilities and that should be considered in the analysis of the draft housing element. Um, we strongly encourage the city, if you have not already done so, to engage with other disability serving organizations that support these other disabled populations in San Mateo County, including but not limited to Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities across disability serving organization and Mental Health Association of San Mateo County and Solutions for Supportive Homes, both of which are support, uh, support persons with mental health disorders. And this is just to get a better picture of what are the different accessibility needs of different persons with um, uh, disabilities other than developmental disabilities. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Maricela Ramos. I see you put your hand down, but did you want to provide a comment? Okay, so Maricela Ramos, if you'd like to uh, make a comment, please feel free to engage that hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll go to our next speaker, Adina Levin, followed by Andrew Bilak. Uh, Dina, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, good evening, city council members, Adina Levin, uh, Menlo Park resident. And I wanted to, uh, first of all, um, really thank the uh, uh, city and staff and consultants for uh, really working hard on um, getting a good uh, housing element that um, meets the state requirements and importantly uh, meets the needs of our city and region and state for homes for people of all income levels addressing the uh, housing uh, uh, shortage that is uh, such a problem for uh, people to be able to live in our uh, community and region. I wanted to, first of all, make some specific comments about the transportation policies and programs, and then make a few other comments. Um, on the transportation, there's some uh, very good programs that are listed in here, including um, H6F, which is the Transit Incentives to Integrate Transportation uh, Demand Management Strategies. And it called out in areas further from transit to increase a access to transit, which is uh, good. And um, also this is really important um, even and especially in transit rich and service rich areas where incentives can really reduce the amount of cars that people uh, need to own to be able to get around and the amount of traffic in our, our denser areas. And there are a number of really good examples of cities in our region that have updated their policies to plan for and provide incentives for a much lower rate of driving in the transit and service rich areas like Redwood City, Mountain View, San Jose, Berkeley. You know, we can look at good examples in place. Um, uh, H6G neighborhood connectivity, um, uh, walkability access to services, particularly in low resource neighborhoods. This is excellent and also likely to be very synergistic with the environmental justice element that is coming forward. And the H4M updating the parking requirements um, to provide greater flexibility. Um, this is really important to provide more space to provide homes for people and reduce the amount of driving and traffic. And in particular, it's helpful to have the in-lieu fees that can be used to support non-driving transportation. Um, also wanted to make a few other uh, comments um, with regard to the really varying uh, quality and likelihood of developing uh, of the sites. Would like to really encourage the another pass through with a, a much more focus on weighting the likelihood of development, and then um, provide uh, increased density in some of the areas that are more likely to develop. Um, I would want to uh, support. Uh, including the Civic Center as an area that is under the city's control and can be used for deeply affordable housing and would not want to reduce the density of the flood school site and would really want the city to work very closely with that school district to be able to achieve their goals for affordable housing for teachers and school staff. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So 
So our next speaker is Andrew Bialak, followed by Karen Grove. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members, uh, members of the public and staff. This is Andrew Bialak. I'm Associate Director of Development at Mid Penn Housing. Uh, we are a nonprofit affordable housing organization that owns um, and operates five communities here in Menlo Park. Um, I appreciate all the work that's been done so far um, and a lot of the, um, the wide variety of, of tools that are looked at and examined and have been considered by staff and um, elected officials in the city to uh, attack this challenge, which um, is really multifaceted and involves many different approaches to really get the, um, get the strategy right. So, so I think this um, draft housing element takes a lot of great steps forward. Um, and a few things I wanna comment on uh, within it you know, one, I really appreciate the attention to um, various incentives that can encourage the development of uh, affordable housing. When it comes to something like a housing uh, overlay zone, um, I, I think that's a really good strategy. And I think we need a little bit more specifics on what exactly is included, what are the policies that will be covered, and ensuring that it's going to provide tangible benefits above and beyond the state density bonus law, particularly when it comes to areas that are accessible to transit where there's a lot of flexibility at the state level. Um, and then on areas like density, height, parking, various components. On something like the implementation of this housing element, I wanna note that a really key component is ensuring that there's a reasonable time frame and strategy for implementation of the strategies. Um, when it comes to something like ministerial review of affordable housing, um, the document cites a three-year time period, um, which you know I noticed is almost halfway through the next iter through the current iteration of the housing element. So, um, other components also have a two to three timeline for implementation. So I want to make sure there is, you know, a realistic strategy for implementing these in a time frame that can ensure there's still forward progress. Um, I think on another point that I want to highlight is the, as a follow-up item to the implementation of this housing element is ensuring that there is a strategy for getting viable sites, particularly publicly owned sites, um, planned for and have the city coordinate a, a, an action plan to release these for requests for call qualifications. So there is a process to actually solicit developer interest and have a path forward towards realistic implementation of the policies and programs that are described here. Same goes for some of the larger sites. And in cases where the city is talking about inclusionary sites and potential partnerships, that city staff uh, engage with both nonprofit and market rate developers to ensure it has a realistic plan of action to actually incentivize these sites getting developed. Uh, finally, the, the document talks about fee waivers having been through the city's process uh, before with development. I think there could definitely be some clarification and standardization about how those fee waivers are applied to ensure predictability uh, for developers and particularly affordable projects moving forward in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Karen Grove, followed by Nicole Chisari. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Karen Grove, and I am a resident of District 5 near the Sharon Heights Shopping Center. Um, so my first comment is how excited I would be to see that shopping center redeveloped. Um, I can, you know, make up a really beautiful um, little mini village with lots and lots of homes and great diversity of restaurants and services and, you know, keep, keep the grocery store as well. And, it would be a real asset to the community. Um, I did read with interest the letter from Mr. Bohannon about densities that would actually incent redevelopment of his property, which is a different one, but it was in the order of 150 to 200 units per acre. And I would support that at the Sharon Heights Shopping Center as a neighbor of that shopping center. So I wanted to put that out. Um, I also wanted to speak about another site, the flood school site. Um, I was really disappointed and confused um, with staff's recommendation to limit the density to the base density of 30 units per acre at a time when the school district is actively seeking proposals to develop up to 90 units, which would not be allowed if we were to take staff's recommendation. Um, that just seems really contrary to our goals, um, contrary to our 
you know, meeting our arena goals, contrary to valuing the children in our city who attend the Ravenswood City School District. And I'd just really like us to support the school district in their endeavor to house their education staff um, by building affordable housing that we all so desperately need. And then finally, I just wanna say that um, as a member of Menlo Together, um, I helped to write the two letters that um, we submitted. And I wanna just reiterate in the programs letter in particular, the emphasis on strengthening the proposed tenant protections and accelerating them and adding some concrete milestones, as um, Andrew Bielak just said, for the affordable housing overlay, for ministerial review, for tenant protections, um, and for, re, uh, for updating our below market rate guidelines, including our commercial impact fee. All of those things are so highly, highly leveraged um, that we should implement them at the speed of, I don't know, at the speed of the need. Um, and for that, of course, we do need to staff our housing department, which is currently empty um, and should probably have at least three people. So with that, I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Nicole Chassari, followed by Leslie Feldman. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I want to speak to site 38, the flood school site. Um, first, I uh, appreciate the staff's recommendation to, to lower the density by not applying the, uh, the city's uh, overlay, density overlay. Um, however, the state density overlay or um, bonus still applies, which would allow for roughly 140 units at that site, um, even with that, that alteration, um, which is still too much uh, given the way that the project is planned um, and doesn't take into consideration any of the comments of the uh, people in the neighboring single family home residential communities um, that would be impacted by a high density project in their neighborhood. Um, in particular, um, the people in that community have repeatedly asked for another access point, um, that the traffic from high density would be completely uh, overly burdensome and hazardous uh, to that community. Um, and that has not been addressed. And uh, I think that needs to be addressed in order to allow for that level of density at that site. Um, in addition, that particular site does not affirmatively further fair housing. Um, it's up against a freeway. It has tons of air pollution. A school or daycare center wasn't even allowed to be built there because of the air pollution. It's not near amenities and resources or opportunities. Um, it's an underperforming school district, doesn't have access to public transportation, um, just doesn't meet any of the elements for affirmatively furthering fair housing. So if any sort of project is going to be built there, um, that would be affordable housing. Um, those need to be addressed. Um, transportation needs to be provided. Um, and you know other, other, other things need to be provided for um, that could make it actually fit that criteria um, to the extent that it could be possible. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention the uh, site 12 of the USGS building. I, I don't know why uh, in the plan it says it's only 5.7 acres. My understanding is it's 17 acres. Um, I appreciated the staff's recommendation to add housing there to increase the amount from 320 that's in the draft. I think it should be more. Um, I think most of it should be affordable if it can be uh, because that site is near public transportation. It is near amenities. It is in a good school district. Um, and I think that would be a great site for, for developing. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Leslie Feldman, followed by William Edgar. So Leslie, it doesn't look like you have a microphone engaged just yet. Um, so I'm going to move to William Egger and then come back to you, Leslie Feldman. So William, if you'd like, you can provide your comment now. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm the Chief Business Officer of Ravenswood City School District, a district that includes the Bellhaven neighborhood of Menlo Park. We currently own the, formerly, uh, the former flood school site. Over the past few years, we've worked with the city, our community, and numerous others to explore possible uses for the site. As part of that exploration, we ran a public request for proposals. We then evaluated our proposals 
based on the ability of these proposals to one, bring in much needed revenue to the district in order to close the vast funding and equity between Ravenswood and the surrounding districts, and two, to find ways to benefit our community. Based on the proposals we received, our board voted unanimously to proceed uh, with exclusive negotiations with a developer who is looking to build 80 to 90 units that are 100% affordable. Moreover, this housing would have a preference for all of our Ravenswood staff, including our teachers, including our bus drivers, including our custodians, and so on. This would significantly benefit our families, of which over 40% be across the highway fellow residents in Menlo Park from the suburban park community who uh, are in our district, are currently unhoused, 40% are currently unhoused or underhoused. We also recently surveyed our staff. Over a third of our staff currently report not having a safe, secure, and affordable housing option, and three quarters would explore seriously living in this community if we were able to develop it. We recognize that there has been a lot of active misinformation. We are not and have not and never have planned on 200 units for the site. We have always consistently explored 80 to 90 units. And we are actively exploring alternative entrances through the site, even though we don't control those alternative entrances, we're actively lobbying those who do. Um, there's other misinformation that's not worth getting into around you know, claims of air pollution or uh, calling our district low performing. And to help combat these falsehoods, we're continuing to engage in this process with our staff, our community, um, the neighbors of the site, as well as the rest of Menlo Park and the broader community. At this point, we are still negotiating with a developer and we do not yet have an agreement with them. And so we can't address some of the issues specifically until we have an actual plan that we're able to bring to the city. Um, tonight, we hope the council does not take any action that would limit our ability to work together with the city staff to make these 80 to 90 units that are 100% affordable a reality. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So it looks like Leslie Feldman. I'm going to come back. No, it still doesn't look like we have a mic for you, uh, Leslie, so I will uh, come back to you. Uh, our next speaker will be Katie Baruzzi. Hi, this is Katie Baruzzi. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Great. I'm using a new device tonight. Um, so uh, I was actually um, hoping to say something in support of the flood school site, but I think I will not um, attempt to compete with um, William Egger on that front. Uh, I just want to add that I support um, uh, exactly what he asked for, that staff and council will work with Ravenswood um, to let them at least get a project proposal forward and not limit anything pre preemptively. Um, I also want to just, um, I guess I want to call out that like, uh, I too am skeptical that some of the sites that are listed are, are viable. Um, I was interested in David Bohannon's letter and I'm curious about whether or not we could be working more closely with some of the property owners closer to downtown and our transit hubs to find out how much more density might compel them to build housing. I also noted that some sites aren't even on the list like the Red Cottage Inn, which has a sort of dead in the water proposal to redevelop the hotel. I'm wondering why um, anecdotally I've heard that you know, housing might be a possibility there. And I'm hoping that staff can um, not totally eliminate sites like that that have potential. Um, on the policies front, um, especially uh, given SB9 and given ADUs um, and some of the SB9 proposals coming forward to Atherton, I really wanna draw attention to the idea of a rental registry. So many of our residents um, who are renters are actually living in lower density housing um, than the places where our rental protections currently apply. So we know that, for example, a majority of residents in um, Bellhaven, I believe, are, re are renters. A lot of them are rent burdened, but also a lot of those housing units that they're renting are single family homes. Um, SB9 would not apply to those single family homes that have renters living in them right now, but we wouldn't know that unless we knew where people were renting. Um, I also really don't like the idea of letting people count ADUs toward housing if all they're doing is building a home office or a pool cabana. Um, and so I think that, or, you know, an Airbnb thing. So it would be really nice if we knew too, uh, at that granular level, you know, where are people renting things out in our city and what are they going for? I think that will really help us get a grasp on our housing needs and opportunities. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, I want you to consider strongly, especially in the downtown specific plan area, um, reducing parking requirements 
Um, Minneapolis has done this citywide and it was, it's like one of the most amazing success stories. Um, they've actually seen um, a decrease in housing costs and an increase in housing production. Um, there was a really great article in Reason that I just read about this. So um, I also support many of the policies, all of the policies really um, that Menlo Together drew attention to. Um, and I'm impressed with everybody who's been digging into that 708 page document um, and thank everybody for their good faith effort to make this work. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Bell Haven Empowered, followed by Liz Hove. And I'll ask that Bell Haven Empowered state your name for the record if you don't mind. Hello, this is Pamela Jones, and I didn't realize that that is what was on my, um, what I signed in with. Pamela Jones, resident of the Bellhaven neighborhood of Menlo Park, representing myself. I want to thank the council, staff, consultants uh, for bringing us to this point in the process. Um, I want to emphasize some of the points in my written comment. And I do understand that some of the proposed opportunity sites may not be available or unrealistic for various reasons, and that's fine. But some of the sites that are available include vacant lots and parking lots, including downtown parking lots. Without concrete proposals and studies such as uh, um, traffic impact, no, no vacant lot, and I'll repeat that, no vacant lot or parking lot should be excluded if the city intends to meet its affirmatively furthering fair housing obligation under AB 686 by spreading the housing throughout the city. A little history. Connect Menlo General Plan approved in, uh, on November 29th, 2016, and the downtown specific plan approved July 12th, uh, 2012, must be reviewed and amended as appropriate. The amendment should include greater housing density in the downtown specific area. It is important for all of us to remember that Menlo Park, Menlo Park did this, approve substantial space, office space, prior to adopting the uh, Connect Menlo General Plan in 2016. This further worsened the jobs, housing, and balance. I appreciate the challenges um, that continue to come up for each of you, council members, as well as staff and uh, consultants, um, but I do strongly, strongly believe that we as a city, that we have a moral, ethical, and legal, the housing element, responsibility to alleviate some of the imbalance that we actually created. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Liz Hove, followed by Misha Sillian. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, taking my call, I appreciate it. Um, I'm Liz Hovey, I live in a uh, suburban park and I have some specific concerns about how we're implementing below market um, uh, housing in Menlo Park. And based on the AFFH guidelines, we're supposed to be promoting equity and reducing segregation as we develop new housing opportunities in the city. Specifically respect to site 38 and Flood Park, you are currently proposing a high density below market rate multifamily rental property in a low density residential neighborhood. The tenants of this future property will be immediately adjacent to the highway to 101 in a location previously determined to have such poor air quality that it can't be used for school or daycare. Future de tenants will not be within walking distance of public transit, grocery stores, pharmacies, or schools, et cetera. The residents will be assigned to the Ravenswood School District rather than to the Menlo Park City School District, which is a very high performing school district. You are furthering inequality by pushing more low income rentals right up along Bayfront, contributing to the existing segregation of the city. Given the goals of the AFFH, Site 38 Flood Park School is not an appropriate location for below housing. 
In addition to the problems for future tenants, placing high density residential housing in our low density zoned location has adverse environmental impacts on the existing community. If you feel this site is appropriate for high density housing, despite what I've mentioned before, my concerns and the concerns of many people in suburban park, you need to acknowledge the infrastructure limitations and create new access points for car traffic to mitigate the significant environmental impacts of such a development. Without creating new road accesses, you are placing current and future residents at significant risk due to fire safety concerns, as well as general pedestrian safety on a small road that was not meant to support a large amount of traffic. There are ways to ensure Site 38 for, um, there, excuse me, there are ways to use Site 38 for housing that lessens the impact on the existing community and still allow the school district, Ravenswood, to profit off its development. You are responsible for the environmental impacts of future development, especially when such developments are not in compliance with the existing community plan. Think about how you do this. Do it thoughtfully, make it equitable for new and existing residents. If you decide to pursue the development, make the zoning change con um, um, on um, using or working with uh, the county cooperation for a primary road access through Flood Park. This is your responsibility and should not be left to the community members to plead with the county. Please follow through with your commitment to the residents of this city to ensure their safety, and maintain the existing quality of life for the entire community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Misha Sellen, followed by a <clears throat> telephone call caller calling in with the last digits of 7872. And this will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item C1. So Misha, when you're ready. Hi, good evening. Uh, this is Misha Sillen. I'm a resident of Allied Arts, uh, the Allied Arts neighborhood in Menlo Park. Um, Want to thank staff and M Group for working on this very thorough uh, draft. I was happy to see a lot of uh, things in it, like kind of honesty about our city's past and where we're at. I was also happy to see in the staff report um, some responses to previous comments made by the public and efforts to improve the draft, such as removing some of the sites where the owners uh, wrote in saying they have no plans to develop. Um, I did send in an email, I think four months ago regarding uh, some of the sites, particularly the commercial ones on Sand Hill and Middlefield, um, feeling that they were unrealistic. And the SF Chronicle article about Menlo Park seems to kind of support that from some other perspectives. So uh, my first comment is I agree with staff's recommendation to remove any sites that we think are unrealistic, um, not only based on the owner saying they won't develop, but just kind of common sense, um, extremely expensive office parks on Sand Hill Road will not become housing, in my opinion. Um, and let's instead strengthen sites that are have a lot of potential and have developer interests, such as USGS, SRI, uh, any city-owned land, and any land where the developer, like Mr. Bohannon, is raising their hand and saying, I'm interested. Um, so I'd like to suggest raising densities on those parcels I would also just push for generally raising density downtown. It seems like a no brainer that we should allow more density downtown than we do in the Bayfront, given how much uh, access there is to different services and transit and everything else. Um, so that's another policy that I would ask to strengthen compared to 30 dwelling units an acre, which is what we have now. And uh, to kind of echo what Katie Baruzzi said, it does seem like um, in my conversations with developers and just reading literature, removing parking minimums can go a long way uh, to lowering the cost of building. And given that we have very aggressive climate goals in Menlo Park, that seems like another policy to focus on and really buffer up in this uh, cycle. So again, thank you for all your work. I think we're, we've done a lot of good work and we just need to push a little bit further to crystallize some of the policies that are mentioned to really make this a very strong housing element. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comment. So our final speaker is calling in from 7872. And I'll ask that you state your name for the record, please. Hello. Um, hello, this is Kathleen Daly, a business owner in Menlo Park. I'm calling in to um, offer support to William Eggers and the Ravenswood School District for the housing site at Flood Park School. Um, I think there's a lot of it, misinformation out there, and I think uh, Mr. Egger said it brilliantly, which is this has not even been fully developed. There is not a complete plan in place to decide whether or not it's good or bad. We are talking about an affordable housing site for teachers and staff, for every child in Menlo Park, every child in San Mateo County, no matter where they live. This is a place where families, teachers, janitors, librarians, substitute teachers, assistant teachers, uh, the people that um, go in and hug your child when they forgot their lunch, all the things that make our schools great. This is a potential to give some really great people an affordable place to live. We should all care about that. We should all care that this has not been fully developed. I've driven back there. I understand some of the concerns. I think if we all gather together and if it means pressuring the county to look at the alternate routes, then we, then we do that. We all work together to make sure that something like this is possible and can happen. And I, at the end of the day, I say, if not for teachers and staff, then who? It, they, they don't even have a plan yet. They've not said 240 units. They've said 80 to 90. They have been talking to the county. They're trying to work this out. Let's please give them a chance. These are our children, all of our children, all of our children. And these are teachers and staff that are committed to making a difference for our children, all of our children. And once again, if not them, then who? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mayor Nash, having no further hands, you may continue. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to all the public commenters with the excellent um, comments and questions. And with that, before we begin um, council discussion, I'd like to give staff an opportunity to address um, some of the questions and comments. Thank you. I have a couple pages of notes, so I will pick out what I think may be um, of interest to, to the council and uh, feel free to add, add to my list. Uh, we had 16 speakers. The first speaker was uh, disappointed about some of the language removed regarding school districts, uh, which was also mentioned by Superintendent Burmeister. Uh, we'll have to research that a little more. I did some quick searching around and I didn't see anything jump out at me right away. So I'm not prepared to uh, respond to that directly, unfortunately. Um, our second speaker and several of the other speakers talked about a general increase in the base density uh, for the housing opportunity sites, um, most of which are settled at that 30 dwelling units per acre as the base and with allowances to go up to 100 dwelling units per acre for 100% affordable housing projects. And that was a very uh, thoughtful, deliberate decision in the very beginning of this process, working with the Planning Commission, the Housing Commission, the staff, the council about that dichotomy of as base densities go up, um, it will in general incentivize, incentivize a lot of market rate development, which Menlo Park has already, just purely from a housing element perspective, Menlo Park has already satisfied 100% of the above moderate income, AKA market rate housing requirement for this new cycle that hasn't even started yet. That's been satisfied by all of the large projects, approved, planned, approved, and some of them have constructed and occupied, some of them under construction, uh, some of them going through that pipeline process. Those, those numbers, based on that, the high densities, those projects were able to achieve, all of the market rate housing has been, been, been satisfied just purely from a 
a planning perspective. Obviously, the real estate market could absorb more additional market rate housing, but this plan was really strategically designed to incentivize affordable housing. And so that's a, a strong um, policy position to not go through and essentially raise the cost of real estate to the point, point that affordable housing just can't compete with market rate housing. Um, also concern about, uh, well, so, some speakers talked about increasing developer fees. Other speakers talked about lowering fees specifically for ADUs. Like, obviously a case could be made for both. Uh, in general, uh, the, the plan seeks to identify any fees that uh, should be considered uh, for lowering if they're shown to be an impediment uh, to creating housing. However, some fees obviously can be used to help incentivize um, affordable housing. So there's there's some there's some nuance there that we can we can discuss. Uh, in terms of site number fifty one, uh, the uh, the Guild uh, Theater that, that was mentioned. Um, if that if that it indeed has been the subject of intensive investment and revitalization, that would that would make it a a good candidate to be removed from the list. So we'll we'll definitely look into that more. We appreciate that uh, real time information. Um, I'll well, just add, since, since you're there, that, that comment was also tied to a, a comment about the cornerstone property across the street and the, um, the city owning that. That's potentially a good, a good yeah, better yeah, site. Yeah. I'm just going to let that's you right. guys Thank know, you. I don't think that's possible due to a long-term lease. So I don't think it's going to require much research. Thank you. Just making a quick note there. Um, Alicia Webster talked about the, the definition of of, of folks with disabilities and we'll, we'll uh, take another pass at that. Uh, uh, Andrew Belak from Midpen uh, talked in some detail about the need for a very clear and concrete uh, incentives. Um, so we will definitely um, acknowledge that comment and seek to uh, strengthen those where we can. Some other speakers talked about increasing the the densities to the levels uh, requested by by one of the property owners at the 150 to 200 dwelling units per acre. I, at this point, I my recommendation would be. Uh, if that were done, it, that it would be done within the context of incentivizing affordable housing and not necessarily just more market rate housing, unless the council makes a, a policy shift to go, to go in that direction, of course. And then also questions about uh, the recommendations for site number 38, also known as the former uh, flood school site uh, in district two, um, adjacent to the flood park. Um, the staff report has a table and a recommendation to keep that at the base density of 30 dwelling units per acre and possibly remove the provision for the affordable housing overlay. Um, and so that's an area um, we can entertain further discussion um, if, if interested, because obviously there's lots of different possibilities there given the, the, the things that are happening with that site more access points needed. There was uh, questions or comments about a, a rental registry um, and how some of the renter protections may not be applying to uh, people renting uh, ADUs and or uh, single family properties. Uh, so that's something we can definitely uh, take another look at. We do have very good data on uh, ADUs rentals themselves and what the different 
um, income categories that are addressed by that through a countywide uh, survey that's been essentially pre-approved by HCD. So we're pretty sure we won't get um, any, any pushback on that. Sorry, I can't breathe with this on. Okay, it's got one more graduation to get through and then I don't have to wear that anymore. Um, In terms of, again, uh, touching back on site uh, 38, uh, the issue around proximity to the freeway uh, and how that site comports with fair housing provisions. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the, ch the charge under fair housing is really to provide housing for all members of the community at all the different income levels throughout, throughout the entire community. And so this this area obviously is a is is a is a high opportunity area. It has good um, good features in terms of uh, being close to the park, uh, being being relatively uh, close to to some of the services folks need. The fact that it's that it is adjacent to the freeway is in, a, is in and of itself is not is not disqualifying, um, especially when we're talking about multifamily housing. That have centralized uh, ways of, of handling air and purifying air quality, indoor air quality specifically, uh, that, that can be significantly uh, improved. And given that the, the school district is a public agency, and one of our strategies coming out of the gate was to focus on publicly owned property, because we saw the track record there throughout the county, uh, that the most deeply affordable projects are coming from, usually coming from projects that are generated on publicly owned property. So I feel like that property has several different ways that it, that it fits into the, uh, to this framework. Okay, I think I've, I think I've exhausted all the things that I saw kind of poking out a little bit that I wanted to address. I'm happy to entertain uh, specific questions from the council along with staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. So what I thought we would do tonight is to actually go through the list of sites for further consideration one by one and talk about those, talk about the policies and then see what else we want to add to that. Um, Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, at, at the outset, I think what would be helpful for me to understand as we go through those is to understand if my colleagues are interested if during the staff's uh, presentation, initial presentation, I believe the number of units that they shared that we need to hit is 1,469. And so what I'd like to know is if my colleagues are interested in keeping a running tally of units assigned to sites so we know exactly if we're getting close to the number of units we need to create. I believe that those are the number of affordable units that we need to hit. Um, so that's fine. And but I'd like to. Can we keep a tally re with related to this to the different sites of where we're at? Because as we're going through right now, what I'd like to know is just as we talk about each one, what's the gap that we still need to make up? Is there a place that you can that that can be listed? Yeah, I, I think we can we could do that in real time. Thank you. I'll just message my team here. Thank you. Councilmember Combs. My only question is that 1400 number a gap related to what we're doing with these sites? Is, is that, I didn't understand that like, that is the gap that we are looking to, um, to close with the, the sites that we're going to go through now. I thought the sites we're going to go through now are identified for a number of reasons why you guys wanted further direction. But, uh, but, again, but again, not that we were using this process of getting that further direction um, to close that gap, but, but I could be missing something. Yeah, um, 
1469 is really the, the target, right? And it is all affordable as, as one of you mentioned, uh, but that's simply because like I said earlier, all the market rate housing has already been met through the, the large pipeline projects in district one. Uh, so 1469, uh, I'm gonna call it 1470 around numbers, almost 1500, I'm gonna call it almost 1500. Um, that's really the target. That's what, that's what we need to plan for and that's what we need to build. Because that is the actual target that we wanna build, we're actually planning for, through our housing opportunity sites, 3000, because we know not all the sites are gonna redevelop within the eight year time period. Uh, some sites will never redevelop. Other sites may be developed at a lesser density than we had hoped for, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my, my guess is if, if you went through that list and you made judgment calls, took some off, reduced some unit counts, increased some unit counts, it really wouldn't appreciably change the overall viability of the whole plan, just based on the order of magnitude that we're talking about there. Counter Mueller. Yeah, I wanna go over that again, just to make sure I understand it. So the total number of units that we need to hit for this to be acceptable, accepted by HCD is 1,469 affordable units. Correct. And that's it, 1,469 affordable units in our housing element based on what we have in the pipeline is accepted by HCD. Well, that's that's the hard number that we, we need to build to meet the actual RENA requirements. Okay. And to, in order to justify in order to show that, that we have a reasonable chance of doing that, you, you have to provide the buffer, which we're doing, right? We have a 30% 30 buffer, 30 buffer right. right? And we have to have some acknowledgement that not every single site is gonna develop, which is another way of thinking of a bu another buffer. And but that's the part that I don't follow because we had, didn't have to do that in prior housing elements. So there was the number that you needed to hit to zone four, and then there was the buffer but the extra on top, I've never heard of before. Is that something required by HCD or is that something that we're adding in because we want to, we want to do something extra? This is really new for this six cycle because the previous cycles, there was really no accountability of actually meeting the target. If the city had a certified housing element, there was a, an assumption of good faith. The city was trying to meet its target but if you didn't actually build the arena numbers, there was, there was no consequences, zero. Having, not having a certified housing element, there were definitely consequences. So there was a lot of pressure to have everything look good on paper, but if you didn't build it, there was no penalty and there was no carry forward of unbuilt demand. This is a totally new environment now. We have all these new state laws that, you know, four years into this housing element, there'll be a checkup, right? And they'll make a list of all the cities that are on track to meet their housing production. And those cities that aren't meeting it get subject to SB 35, where a developer can come in and say, I'm just, I'm building this project. You have 90 days to approve it. There are a lot of penalties for not actually building the housing units. And so we, we are providing a capacity so that we can make a reasonable estimate and forecast that we can get to that 1500 units. So I'm just going to push back a little bit because in my history here at Menlo Park, development wise, when we've made development available, it's been built. And so my question is, is if we go ahead and we zone for 3000, is there a built in cap if you hit the 1469? There's no caps. Caps are illegal now under SB 330. We can't cap any, anything. So, so what you're saying is that we're going to zone for 3,000, even though we have 1,469, that's all that's required, and that in, within that eight-year time period, the city could actually have to build the 3,000 that people bring forth applications for it. Correct. That gives me pause, because what I would rather do is zone for the 14,000, I mean, excuse me, the 1,469 on sites that we believe it's going to be built in good faith because I, I just be candid with you in my history in Menlo Park, I have not seen that we have zoned sites and it wasn't built on those sites. I think the issue here is that 
we're not talking about just having them built. We're talking about having them built at various affordability levels. And that's where the gap is. Correct. And so I guess one of the questions is as we zone, it is our housing or it is our housing policies that ensure that we're not getting market rate housing there and that we're instead getting affordable housing. And could you please speak to that? Sure. So yeah, I agree. I agree with Councilmember Mueller that the, the city has done a good job in overall housing production, especially this last cycle. Uh, but we didn't come anywhere close to meeting our very low, our low, and our moderate. Uh, whereas market rate housing was produced at eight hundred percent over and above um, the the arena level, uh, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing, unless it's some indication that we're doing something that is working for market rate housing, but it's not working for below market rate housing. And so this housing element is really seeking uh, to turn the tide on that and create a structure that really incentivizes the production of housing at those lower income levels. And we believe that in order to do that, we have to have a robust site inventory because as we've heard tonight, uh, there's lots of lots of sites that have different issues that could make it questionable whether they're going to uh, develop in time or not. Yeah, but again, pushing back on that with the affordable housing overlay that's being discussed, the level of density for the affordable units is so high that I can't I can't imagine that if we adopt that, that there isn't going to be market demand to go ahead and develop at that. For, so below, the, for below market rate? Yeah. That's the, that's the hope. But, it, but the problem is, is that the hope, like, respectfully, the hope is compounding because not only are we providing the affordable housing overlay at that formula at a density that I think would produce it, but we're also going to, to create 3,000 3, instead of 416, 1469. I'll pass to my colleagues, but I have some reservations with how we're approaching this. Council Member Combs. Yeah, just really quickly, and I'll let Mayor Nash take the meeting in the direction it was supposed to go next. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Pratt, I'm just a little confused because th there is, uh, Council Member Mueller talked about this idea of there being essentially a buffer, a 30% buffer. And then you said, no, well, the, there's two buffers, um, one 30% and obviously one is quasi 20% uh, now. So what you're putting us on a path towards is a 50% buffer. And what I wanna know is, where are you getting the direction that you have to have a 50% buffer? Where concretely does that exist? It, it exists essentially in the, the new strictness that HCD is looking at the sites. That it says 50%? They never come out and say it that plainly. But one of, the, one of the things that we're seeing out of Southern California, which is a, they were ahead of us yeah. on a different cycle. So they've, they've submitted drafts HCD, they've got their 90 day letter back and it's all posted on the website and anyone can go and read it. And you can see like where the rubber's meeting the, the road. And so basically if, for example, if we say that uh, under the current fifth cycle housing element, only 50% of the sites redeveloped, then that would be something we could say as evidence or trends or information about what we have to support the idea that our sites are gonna redevelop. Unfortunately, most cities in the Bay Area, the percentage of their opportunity sites that redevelop during the fifth cycle is much less than 50%. And I don't have the number at my fingertips for what it is in Menlo Park. Uh, but it's a, it's, a very, it's a very hard look at the opportunity sites and if we can't show that we've accounted for the fact that many of the sites will not re redevelop, then we will, we, will, we will get pushed back and we'll have to add more sites. Okay, this is my final comment. It, it feels like we're negotiating with ourselves <laughs> and, and, and that we're, uh, we're, we're in that negotiation increasing our cost to some, to some degree. And, and so I, I would just, think we should be mindful of that. And, and I appreciate that, again, the Southern California is, is ahead of us in this process, but, you know, uh, you know, Mental Park is not Irvine, right? And so HCD looks at these cities uniquely, 
Like, right. And, and so even if in those scenarios, if, if you can point to like, I don't know, Anaheim Hills or something um, else or Ventura, and, and they are being held to some sort of 50% buffer, um, then I don't know that that, that, that should um, uh, uh, be our, our guide, uh, especially given Menlo's Park uh, history of, of overproducing. Granted, I know it was market rate, uh, but but overproducing. Where I think when you look at you know lots of communities that are really um, uh, facing some pushback, um, they have a history of like not producing <laughs> anything uh, or not not meeting um, what what has been expected. And, and, and like I said, as far as not looking at opportunity size, but the production of units, Middle Park has a history of of, of overproducing. So. But, but yeah, you feel free to respond. I don't want to. If I may, sorry, I don't, I don't want to get into a debate with the council, but respectfully, um, I think we need to acknowledge where we're at in the process, right? Because back in December, January, where we said we really need to settle down on sites and need to authorize us to go forward and do the EIR, um, it was so that we could get to this point and you could go through a list like this and make decisions on sites without really having to worry about the numbers overall because we had collected what we thought at the time was a fairly and we still think is a fairly generous buffer which we're getting feedback on now um and so and the the intent was with that was to cast a wide net so we could do an environmental review process that will renew some sites may drop maybe have pressure to drop off for whatever reason or just purely council discretion and so that's that's where we're at now so in my mind the the process is working. And if the council wants to go forward with 2000 units or something less than what we're showing, then we, we have the ability to do that. I'm not, I'm not here to say it has to exactly be what we have now, but we are, as is being pointed out, we are we do have a healthy uh, overage that, that you can use to make whatever decisions you, you need to make now to feel good about moving forward. One last comment is, um, I believe you're also counting upon some of the affordable housing coming out of the 15% allocation. And so we're not, the idea is not that all of these will be 100% affordable developments. And okay. therefore we're going to pick up some of the market rate units in the process of attaining our affordable units, which, I think we would all agree that if, you know, that is a side effect of hitting these numbers for the affordable units. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I don't necessarily agree with that. The densities we're talking about, just be candid, I don't. I think if the densities that we're talking about for some of these sites that can be full affordable and that's what's that at the, at the contemplated but I think we should go through it, so. Sounds good. So thank you. So we, I was um, planning to go off of attachment G, but it looked like you had the exact same information in the proposal, in the presentation. So do you have a preference um, which we use? Um, no, either, whatever pleases the council, we can follow along with that. Okay, um, let's, City Clerk Karen, then if we could pull up attachment G. Thank you. And the idea is that the council, staff is looking for feedback from the council on each of these sites. I believe we've got um, seven different um, sites that we're looking at. And so the idea is, um, on this first one, which is at Marsh Road, um, the Bohannon properties, um, whether to keep this on the opportunities sites list as has been recommended by staff and increase the densities on the site or whether to um, keep on the opportunities sites list with the affordable housing overlay, bon overlay bonus or remove from opportunity sites list entirely. So, Councilmember Combs. So we're we're providing comment at this. 
on, yes. on, on this process. Okay, so, so what I'm, yes, I think what we're doing is, what I'd like to do is provide comment and come up with essentially five answers. How many of us are agreeing with staff's recommendation or another alternative? Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, so obviously full disclosure, this is in uh, District 2, which I represent. Um, and, and just to confirm, so this is this is now on the opportunity site, right? It, it wasn't initially on the opportunity site, but then there was direction from council that it, it should possibly be on an opportunity site. And so now is it possibly on the opportunity site or is it, it is conclusively on the opportunity site? Probably doesn't matter for my comments, but I just wanted to clarify. I'm sorry, which site? Uh, th this is the the Bohannon uh, property at Marsh Marsh Road. Marsh Road. We're showing this as a collection of of three sites: site sixty five, site sixty six, and site seventy three. And I'm going to ask uh, Asher or Sung to jump in and help me out with some of the details on these late breaking developments. Yes, thanks, Jeff. Um, if I may, um, these sites were added. Um, just generally in this area through um, direction from the city council. Um, and so they are currently proposed opportunity sites until the city council tells us otherwise. Um, we're still in the process. We're still in the public review draft period. So we're now in the process of wanting to get um, council feedback on these sites, whether we should keep them or raise densities or whatever options we've proposed. Um, once we have a draft list, then um, we'll send out the HCD, we'll go through the process, um, and then ultimately at the end when the council is um, adopting the housing element, then the council can, you know, adjust the sites um, as they see fit. But we're trying to get early direction from the council at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, and and I'll, I'll provide my, my comments. Again, as I said, this is, this is in my district. So, um, this is, is, is my concern as, as I approach this. What I've understood is there is this idea that um, um, a lot of the housing that has been produced, and I know there's this weird feedback, I, I don't know what to do with it, so, so I'm just going to continue uh, to, to talk through it. Um, I, I don't think it's directly coming from my mic, um, but uh, part of what, what I have understood is, is what we were trying to correct. Uh, with with this process was the the um, the the large production of housing units um, in, in in district in district one and, and that that going forward through this process we should use it um, as a way to redistribute um, uh, future housing production um, in this site borders <laughs> uh, district one and borders where we have seen the greatest intensity um, and the greatest density. Um, in, in housing production. And so like, if you look at this site, it is actually closer um, to the Menlo Anton and, and, and some of the, the projects right across the freeway than is the actual neighborhood of Bellhaven. So even before you get to a house in Bellhaven, you, from, from those high density sites, this site is closer. And, and so I don't understand how this sort of meets that goal of, of, of redistributing uh, or more equitably looking at where we're putting housing to put, you know, to, to essentially create another high density zoned housing neighborhood right on the border of district one along where all of that, that, that traffic is going to be on, on, on Marsh Road. It, it, it to me seems like in theory, like you, you, you're, you're meeting the letter of the law and you're redistributing, but from a, a point of integrity and ethics, you're not because you're you're still concentrating all of the high density development in the city in in one very specific area of the city, and and so for me that's again I'm not in theory opposed to the idea of some sort of housing on this um, on this site, but if the idea is that again that we are looking at the housing element as a way of redistrib or redistributing future housing production. Um, throughout this, throughout the city, then then this doesn't accomplish that at all, and and I, and I think we have to be uh, fully uh, uh, honest um, with the the residents as 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 we we talk about that. I would also say that you know based on the letter from uh, the Wilhannon organization that the city council received, I mean they're looking at something like two hundred dwelling units an acre, 
right? And I don't think that that is, I don't think he's talking about affordable housing. Um, he, he is talking about, he wants 200 uh, dwelling units an acre market rate. Uh, and, and so so then that would contradict with what Mr. Bradley, you, has, you have said as, 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 as our goal um, uh, in, in looking to, to increase affordable housing and, and actually not incentivizing um, the production of, of, of market rate housing. So again, I, I think if we want to engage in, in this sort of, you know, to some degree theater, then we put this on, on there, or, or we increase this to an, an ATHA affordable housing overlay, but then there is one gonna be no change unless you, you really do give the whole organization the 200 billion units an acre that it wants, um, because that, that's what it thinks it can be profitable at for, for housing. And again, like I say, I think you run into the problem of you're concentrating all of the high density housing um, in the city in, in one area. Thank you. So which, which of the options would you like to state? So it's hard for me to see how this should be on the list unless you're, you're going to give uh, uh, the Bohannon organization, unless you're willing, willing to give the 200 uh, units an acre. Um, and, and so for me, I, I don't see how, um, I, how it makes sense to, to have it as an opportunity site. I do have one question, which may be somewhere, and, and I don't know the answer to this. Um, what school district is this in? Is this in the Redwood City School District? It is. Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. So I will um, go ahead and um, be the next speaker on this. And I guess my first question, well, I will first state, I'm not interested in increasing density to get market rate housing. I am interested in developing affordable housing. I'm also interested in not getting other high rise office development buildings there that then create the need for more housing. And so this is what I actually very honestly came in saying, keep on the opportunity list and going with staff's um, recommendation, but I am not interested in increasing the density to get market rate housing. And I guess my first question is, um, what can we do to not, to avoid getting lots of market rate housing other than as it creates some affordable housing, but at 15% level, how do we get to our market rate housing? I mean, sorry, our affordable housing. As you, as you step back and look at the whole picture with, the, with all the Bay Area cities in the same situation, and that all the cities are gonna have, uh, or most of the cities are gonna have a housing element that tries to do what we're doing here, um, and then it, it's really gonna come down to those, those cities that have the other pieces of the puzzle in place, such as political support, uh, financial incentives, willingness to partner with nonprofit groups to build, actually build the housing. Um, so you, I almost think of it as like a competition. All the cities are in competition to, to build a limited supply of, of affordable housing because there's only so much capacity to do that type of work. And I, and I think the folks who do that are gonna to choose to work with those cities that have put the most pieces of the puzzle together. And I think that the piece that's missing the most in Menlo Park and just about every other city, um, absent redevelopment since 2011, there has not been a dedicated revenue stream for cities to spend on affordable housing. And so those cities who have somehow been able to create a durable revenue stream through through impact fees or property transfer taxes or something that goes into a fund that's dedicated solely to affordable housing, that's that's gonna be the difference maker in my mind for, the, for those cities that are able to actually attract those types of projects that can, that can actually move the needle on meeting the, the housing requirements and the goals of the housing element itself. Thank you. And I guess um, to city staff, is there a way to discourage 
the additional office that would then create the need for housing? Can we somehow um, have a linkage to the between if someone wants to put on additional housing, I'm sorry, additional staff, sorry, if someone wants to put on additional office that we need to have some affordable housing as well as presumably some market rate housing with it. Thank you, Marnash. That are you speaking particularly to these sites along the uh, Marsh Bohannon corridor? I'm speaking generally. In generally, okay. So I, I think it it depends on um, the zoning, and so I, I think the zoning can be a, a tool where um, whether existing offices could be rebuilt if there was redevelopment, or if future redevelopment of a use would be. Uh, converted to a different use such as residential it would not and would not allow for um, office or if it was um, a requirement for future development to include residential prior to including any non-residential uses and so that was what uh, happened in the uh, creation of the RMU zoning district where any future redevelopment of a site needed to include first housing and then it could uh, provide complementary non-residential uses to help support uh, the, the area in terms of whether it's uh, sort of retail uses or personal services or office uses, but the primary use was, was um, residential and uh, the amount of office or non-residential uses that could be built prior to the zone change uh, was not at the same level of intensity. Thank you. And I guess um, my other question is, if we remove it from, the, what does it mean if we leave it on the list at this point? What does it mean, mean if we remove it for development? Sorry, if we leave it on the list um, as is with the 30 acre base density, uh, one acre carve outs for the larger parcels that could go up to 100% or excuse me, 100 billion per acre for affordable housing projects, there'd really be no change um, to the document or to the environmental review. If you, if you took it out completely, um, it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't upset the overall balance of, of sites to, to the arena as we discussed earlier. Um, in fact, my team assures me that we could you could drop all the sites on this list and we would still be meeting our arena with a healthy healthy buffer, um, but we may need to strengthen up some other policies in other places to, to make up for it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, unless there's more detail needed. Council Member Combs. Yeah, so if, if we, what if, if, if we kept it on the list, like right as it, as it is now, um, but then we we have communication from the property owner that this this deal that we're offering isn't going to do it. How does HCD look at that? Like right now, then do we get dinged because clearly we've gotten notice that that this isn't going to be developed at what we've offered? Um, and and so that I, I think more than anything, that would be my only c concern because, like I said, I. I I would lean towards taking it off the list. Although, again, like I said, I don't know if it ever is officially on the list. But then again, you know, if it provides some benefit, then we can keep it on the list. But then, like I said, we have a letter from the the the, the property owner saying that 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 this won't do it. Now, maybe they're just trying to negotiate, and maybe this would do it. Um, but but I I would lean more towards taking them at their word. You know, th this came up before in reference to the Big Five site on El Camino. There was sort of longstanding city policy that that would be a good housing site in near the downtown, close to transit, close to services. Uh, but the property owner was adamant, no housing going on here, long-term leases, big easement coming through the back. Um, and so the, the thinking the team had to deal with that situation was, Keep it, keep it on as an opportunity site, uh, but dial down the probability of development within the planning period to zero. So you're basically not taking credit for it from, in terms of generating numbers in the document, but you're just, but you're still giving it that status 
as a housing opportunity site to send a signal to whoever's prepared to receive the signal that that, that site is officially supported for housing by the city for its own reasons, not because we're counting 100 units for the housing element, um, but as a long-term planning goal, it's in the previous last two previous housing elements, you know, for a reason. And so there, there was a good logic to keep it in there if we wanted to, but basically don't claim any credit for it because we know there's, there's big roadblocks. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you, Mr. Bradley. Just following up on that big five site, I believe in the housing element, it's showing 60 units at that site. So is it just turning the dial, not all the way down, but a lot down? Sung or Asher, can you confirm the status of that site? You guys up there? There he is. Hi, sorry, um, I am up here. I was um, working on preparing a tally for the sites we're discussing tonight per uh, Councilman Mueller's uh, suggestion. So um, I don't have that sheet up at the moment, but if you give me another few moments, I can get there. Yeah, I believe it's site 48R. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor Wilson, if I may. So if I'm, I'm looking at the, the site sheet and it shows total units zero, um, carve out zero, max affordable units zero. I apologize, there's not a sheet number. Um, I, I'm on the hard copy, but it's like, you, uh, as you mentioned, it is site 48R and at the bottom where it identifies um, potential units, it shows zero. I guess I have, may I, uh, Mayor Nash? I'm, I think I might have been confused how to read these site sheets, um, Mr. Bradley, because I was reading page two of each site sheet as the projected development potential for each site. But should I be looking at page one of every site sheet for the projected development? Yeah, so, so site one, or sorry, page one, of each sheet is basically the factual information that's non-debatable, lot size, address, assessed value, whether it meets certain criteria, yes or no, max number of units, minimum number of units by, by zoning, which are those, are, those are controllable by the city and its police power. Side two gets into more of a narrative description of some of the market trends and things happening in the neighborhood around the site to support the idea that this site will develop or not during the planning period. And that's where we get into the realistic unit potential by income level, which is very debatable, right? You, ACD could look at this and say, oh, you're too aggressive. You need to dial this back. Um, and so that's, that's the, <laughs> That's the broad way of thinking about these sheets is the, the, the front of the sheet is just the facts and so, the back tries to paint the picture of what we think is likely to happen in the future. So I've spent a long time looking at these sheets. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at the total number of units that we're looking to submit to HCD by income category, are you using page one, which then would say zero so this would have, this isn't on any list going to HCD or are you putting 60 units by these different income categories? I'm unclear. Are you looking at site 48R in particular? Yeah, I'm just using that since we were talking about it. Okay, I was, I'm just gonna catch up with you there. I was looking at a different I, one. You could use and I finally have that up. Um, and I could speak, it is sheet two that we use to put together the um, public review draft that you see. So, um, I think there are, there's a few sites where there's, see there appears to be a bit of a conflict between that housing opportunity site criteria um, and those numbers at the bottom of page of sheet one and the numbers in the middle of sheet two. And um, the reason for that is that we put together that criteria when we were um, 
comparing sites to each other. And this was done at the end of 2000 of 2021. And then in the beginning of this year, we really dug into on a site by site basis. Okay. What do we think can be done here? What do we think we can, um, you can see throughout that sheet. This is why we think this is going to happen on the sheet at these income levels at this site. Apologies. So, um, I think uh, there's a little bit of disconnect for this one. I think there might be um, a few others you can see that as well. And what happened is when we reviewed it, we said, we think that what you see in sheet two is what's gonna happen. That's what we're using for the public review draft. Um, may I? Okay. Um, this leads me to, um, I kind of want to make just a general question or comment, <laughs> which I haven't really made yet. Um, like I said, I spent some time looking at, at the sites and, um, I am really, I'm actually concerned that we're gonna meet HCD requirements, even with what we're showing. Um, I've been following this very closely. I know the cycle is different. It's about more units, more enforcement. Um, and um, I think lack of a compliant housing element is putting our city at huge, um, in a really vulnerable spot. And so um, like I was looking at which sites, I think there's 24 sites that are supposed to yield 85% of our affordable housing, 24 sites. Um, those are the non reuse sites that have capacity for lower income. And when I looked at those sites, those 24 sites, they're basically broken into three buckets. One bucket is office that's supposed to redevelop into 100% affordable. And those include those sites on Sand Hill Road, uh, a couple of which we're gonna talk about in a minute and on Middlefield but we're saying an entire you know, bustling office complex is gonna be torn down and affordable housing is gonna go there on top of the Tesla chargers or something. Um, and then the second bucket are downtown parking lots. Um, I believe we have eight of those. And, um, and then the third bucket are kind of a, is a mishmash, some Safeways, both on El Camino and at Sharon Heights, um, like the VA and some other sites. And um, I'm, what I feel like is missing is for each of the sites, the housing element has kind of spit out how many units we think we can yield from that site. But what we don't have is what the probability of that site redeveloping is. So I actually um, looked at Sacramento's housing element. They're like a couple years ahead of us. And they did this thing with tiers like tier one was like very likely to redevelop and like tier two was not as likely to redevelop. And then they assigned kind of probabilities for those different tiers. So I actually played around this weekend with some spreadsheets and was like, okay, let me just say for a minute that the VCs turning over, you know, is 10%, but that the downtown parking lots are all hundred percent, all of them. And let's say that um, the Safeway sites, I don't know, 20%, 50%, like based on the narrative that you guys have on side two of kind of your su substantial evidence. And granted, it was a very subjective exercise. I know I'm not a housing expert. I'm not sharing that um, exercise with anybody. But I think the point it makes is, is the vulnerability of a lot of these sites and what we're counting on to get our affordable units. And so um, I'm fine, you know, looking at these sites and, and removing sites. But I think where the pressure is going to come for us is, um, the policies and um, having them pass muster with HCD that these things are actually gonna happen. And when you read the housing element and you look at the conversations with developers and you know whether the 100 acres is really gonna incentivize the development, it, it's not as, it's not, I, I didn't find it as convincing. Um, so I'm actually um, like, I wanna submit you know, I, I'm okay if we, I realize this is a draft that we're submitting for comment. Um, so I don't believe we have to be perfect right now. You know, right now we're kind of like waiting to see how serious HCD is and, and what's gonna go and what's not gonna go. So, you know, to me, whether we leave it on or don't leave it on, a lot is gonna be up in the air until we understand the feedback from HCD. But I think we as a city shouldn't just sit during this 90 day period um, and rest, I think we need to really dig into, I know we're not talking about the policies yet, but kind of these probabilities and almost go through this exercise for each site. And I don't think it, it's that huge of an exercise because there's not that many sites. I think a lot of them are obvious. Um, and really what I'd love to see for each of these sites 
all of the sites is, you know, how many of these sites did we hear back from the developer? How many did the developer say, yeah, I'm interested at just what you, you're offering? How many said, I'm interested, but I want more? How many said, I'm not interested at all? How many, how many didn't reply? And then use that to help either to engage those developers, try to call them up and have, I actually talked to two developers today, I just picked up the phone and called them and have more of these conversations to get a sense, to help that narrative and um, to help us figure out what it would take and say, and maybe they'd be likely or maybe they wouldn't be likely, but also asking them, so what would it take to get you to, to read the parking minimums, all those different things. So um, I'm happy to go, you know, sorry, I got us off track, but I just wanted to make that initial statement that, um, I get why we have more sites than that 1400 or whatever that number is. And I'm actually concerned, I share your concern about losing sites and about some of these sites actually not being probable of developing and HCD calling us out on it, especially because I know we're being watched. We were written about in the Chronicle. Um, and so I just, I really, if the, a failure to get a compliant housing element means that the state comes in and we lose a lot of our local control. And so this is not like, this is, this is you know, to the benefit of everyone who cares about decisions being made in our community on how we want them to be made. So um, sorry, Mayor Nash, that, that was just kind of an overall comment that I wanted to make. Thank you. So um, let's get back on track, trying to go through the, um, the Marsh Road and Bohannon sites. We've got three sites there. And I would say keep on opportunity site list with the affordable housing overlay bonus. Do not increase the densities which might encourage market rate development. So Council Member Mueller, would you like to, actually we would like, um, could you please state which of those three options you're interested in? I'd like to hear from Council Member Taylor first. Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I'm supportive of keeping it on the list with the housing overlay. Council Member Mueller. Is that three already who've said keep it on the list? I am looking for all five of us to vote so that um, some of uh, us don't have to carry all the weight. No, I'm not asking that though. I am, I'm trying to act. I didn't hear what council member Wollison said or vice mayor Wollison said. And so there's I no think need to make comments us... about who's carrying all the weight. I just wanted to know who had voted. Okay, thank you. Um, so I believe council member Combs has said, um, remove from the opportunities list. And council member Taylor and I have both said, keep on the opportunities list with the affordable housing overlay bonus. Um, vice mayor Wollison has not yet said anything. I hear council member Combs' concerns about this, uh, but he indicated he'd be fine with leaving it on the list. I do have concerns that uh, candidly with Mr. Bohannon's letter that we're not increasing the density nor, and we're just leaving it on. What I would, I would actually be in favor of increasing the density so it actually complied with the logic of what the owner has told us. But if people don't wanna do that, I'm fine with leaving it on the list this way, but I don't think it'll develop. And that goes back to the comment that I would make in response to you guys in terms of whether or not we're meeting the number of affordable units. I think the way you meet the number of affordable units is you actually deal with the reality of how much density you have to put in to get them rather than have a whole bunch that don't produce the out that you're kind of guessing to see if it produces the outcome. I also would suggest tonight to my colleagues that we try to keep the colloquy, which is argumentative toward each other to a minimum. The last meeting got a bit uh, tense and I don't think it's necessary. Thank you. Vice Mayor Wollison. I really don't remember how the vote count was going, but I'm, I'm actually agnostic. Um, I, again, I think this is a draft that this one, I could kind of go either way. So was there a consensus already or not? We're looking for decisions from each council members. 
could I just before uh, uh, Vice Mayor Wollison, if those, and again, hopefully I'm, this is not seen as combative argument, but, but if those of my colleagues who are in support of, uh, of it remaining on the list, it, ex, ex, explain to me or respond to me the concern that, again, this concentrates development in a very specific part of the city. Like this is literally a few, <laughs> a couple of essentially blocks away from the highest density development we have in the city. I reckon, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'd actually say it doesn't because based on the density that we're putting that into the element, we already know it won't develop based on what the, <laughs> with the, so, yeah, so yeah, I'm really, so I'm like, I'm not gonna take it off, but I acknowledge the fact it's not gonna develop based on what the owner said, so. I think it's a long shot for if, you know, at some point, if something changes, we might get some affordable housing, but it's a long shot and we, it's unlikely to get market rate housing because of it. So. And, and I would just say, and again, I'm, I'm going to lose because I totally respect where everyone's coming from. But then even at the long shot, it then still concentrates, you know, high density housing in a specific area of the city. So then if you are in Lorelei Manor, if you have a house right there, um, a Lorelei Lane, then literally I, there are a bunch of like high density housing units, like, you know, not that far away from you. Whereas if you are in West Menlo, right, then, then you don't see any high density units anywhere around you. And, and so if that the idea, the idea, how, how is, so can, can you see high density housing from your house? No, but there's um, many people who can um, in West Menlo, as we are now developing um, a lot around El Camino Real. And very honestly- Well, that's central the, Menlo, that's not West Menlo. So th that's not West Menlo as I would see it. Um, okay, I'm not sure of the distinction then. Uh, um, well, as so, you make your way west of downtown. Uh, I would point out that what this does do is it turns industrial area and rezones it to uh, residential. So, I mean, candidly, that's what I thought. That's why I thought one of my colleagues raised this. That was one of the goals that they were trying to do. So they wanted to make sure that it didn't, didn't redevelop to a denser office down the road. I don't think this will develop at, to residential at this density. So. Vice Mayor Wollison. Yeah, I, I don't think this is gonna develop with this density either. So because of that, I think it's, we should take it off. Okay. That's fine. I'm, Council Member I'm, Mueller, I'm, what I'm did- I'm fine with taking it off then if people want to take it off, so. Well, I think two of us had said, keep it on with the housing overlay bonus. And I apologize, I've already forgotten what you're, and two have said, take it off, so. Yeah, I'll respect my colleagues who are closest to this. So it's fine. I'm happy with taking it off. I just don't think it's going to develop at this density. If we're going to be serious about trying to get, I, I mean, it goes back actually to the logic, logic that I wanted to approach tonight with. I just want to figure out what are the units we need to create and hit those units. Like I really don't want to play in fiction, fiction land. I just want to hit the units we need to hit. And I, and I don't see this being on the list as create as I don't see it furthering what we're trying to get accomplished tonight based on what we've been told by the developer and the lack of interest of the council to up zone to what would be required. I don't know if I should prolong this, but I will just say that um, to me, it is um, an opportunity, it is a long shot opportunity to put in affordable housing elsewhere, it just anywhere. We obviously have to um, hit, a large number of units. And if by chance one of these properties um, it became affordable housing, I think that that would be excellent. And I'm, that is my approach to this exercise across the city, very honestly, um, with a few possible exceptions. I, I, Marby, I, pr I promise this is my last comment on this. I, I, I think that the, I'll just say that with the redistricting maps, there were some maps that put this in district one. <laughs> And so it's really interesting that like, if that had happened in theory, we wouldn't even be having this discussion um, because we have resolved not to um, have any, any opportunity sites in, in this, except for one very specific. And so I just think that that, that to some degree speaks to um, 
what I think is is what what can be what some people could see as, as somewhat absurd about the process, uh, or certainly some elements of it. That again, if the redistricting had moved this into District One, then we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Thank you. So um, it appears that there are three people who are interested in removing it from the list. And so this will be removed from the list. The next um, page, please. Sharon Heights Office Parks. Um, the two choices are to remove from the opportunities list, which is what was recommended by the staff or to keep on the opportunity sites list with an affordable housing overlay bonus. Councilmember Mueller, did you want to go first or? I'll you... listen to my colleagues first uh, to hear your thoughts. It's obviously in my district. Uh, so, uh, but I'm, instead of you hearing me first, I'll listen to all, what you all think, which is fine. Like I, I, I can tell you, I don't know what you guys think. I think it's fictional. Anything's gonna be built here. So. I actually agree. And that's why this one I thought was completely um, okay. unreal unrealistic and I would vote for taking it off the list. Council Member Combs. I, I would only say uh, in comparison to the other site that we just, the, the, the Mars sites, here you do get the, the high performing school district and you do get it located in an area of the city where there isn't affordable housing. And so I, I'm not saying that that means put it on, but but again, as I'm looking, so here the one mark against it is that you have a disinterest, a disinterest in, in, in housing development from the property owner, which I think is 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 very important signal. But again, there there are two other things again working in it in, in its favor. You know that that doesn't change anything, right? If if putting it on the list or, or not keeping it on the list or not having it on the list does doesn't change. Uh, I think that the likelihood of, of the redevelopment, but but I would point out that that in that way this is this is uh, um, distinguishable from from the Marsh Road sites. If you um, do, I would be happy to support keeping it on the list with an with the overlay. Sure, I, I would be a supportive again, like I said, because it, you you have the good school, you you have the more high performing school district that that I'm told, and and. I'll be very frank that that sort of language and nomenclature always makes me feel uncomfortable saying it. Um, but I only say it because that's what I've understood that this is is framed as is one of the elements. But but it is something I do want to say. It it always makes me feel very uncomfortable to say to say things like that. Um, but uh, you, you do have that the school district thing, and and again you have it in an area of the city where 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 there isn't. Uh, other uh, affordable housing, um, um, given that in this case, what we are truly trying to incentivize is affordable housing. So you guys think that you're going to get these VCs to leave this site, even if you put an affordable housing overlay on this? I mean, honestly, the, what we're trying to do is get our housing element done, not make ourselves feel good about picking sites that are fictional. Like, I, I'm, if you guys want to do it, fine. But I just think, like, let's really, like, I really want to focus on, that's why I started with, like, what's our number? I really want to focus on doing realistically what we need to do to hit our number. Vice Mayor Rollison. Um, yeah, when I mentioned I talked to two developers today, this was one of them. And they're very lovely people. They really, you know, want to support housing. But it's not going to happen in the next eight years. It's not part of their strategic plan. Um, I just, they've written a letter saying that this is where I, I think if we're looking at probability percentages, this would have to be discounted to like zero or, you know, 2% if we want. And then I just, I just can't see this. I, I don't want to turn in a fantasy. I want to, to turn in something real. So. Council member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I have a question that's related to this, um, and that this is for staff. With the previous housing element, how many properties were identified and how many were developed? I thank you, Councilmember Taylor. So uh, you're making me get my memory here. And 
so we had uh, much fewer sites and many of our sites were um, rezoned with the R4S zoning district. So our housing opportunity, mostly our housing opportunity sites were focused along um, Willow Road, Hamilton Avenue and Haven Avenue. Uh, and um, then there were what we called scattered sites throughout the city, which focused on uh, areas in the specific plan and then um, other uh, underutilized uh, like R3 zoned properties um, where we increased the density allowed for properties that were of 10,000 square feet or greater um, around downtown. So um, there were, I don't know, maybe I want to say like eight <laughs> housing opportunity sites that were rezoned. Then we focused on our specific plan area and then scatter sites around the city. And then how many were actually developed? Uh, so we had um, a number of the R4S properties redevelop. Uh, unique to that was um, it was a buy right development. Um, a few of those sites did take advantage of our affordable housing overlay, which was also created uh, during um, the Rena 3-4 cycle. Um, and then we did have a few of our specific plan properties also redevelop. And then probably to a lesser extent, um, some of the R3 properties. But a number of, I, I would say, all but one of our R4S properties we developed in the last planning period. So seven of the eight properties were, were developed. I, I can get you the exact number. I'm trying to guess how many, but it's around that, that uh, number. Thank you. I appreciate that information. Um, and just based on what staff just shared, I'm supportive of keeping this site on the list. I want to go on the record. It sounds like you have three. I'm going to go on the record and not be supportive and just say I think it's not in good faith. So I just, I think we're going to get, I think it's going to end up in the press, and potentially nationally that we included it. I think it's just something that people will laugh at candidly. I just don't think it's a good faith addition to the list to say that people are gonna rezone a venture capital firm for affordable housing. I mean, in, in response, I would just say eight years is a long time. Uh, the economy impacts everyone um, and, and venture capitalists don't exist outside of that. And I they, think that's gonna end up as a quote in the that, article. That's very fine to, to end up as a quote because if you go back and you look at venture capital like 30 years ago, there's a bunch of names that don't exist anymore. So, uh, cause, cause they go away. So I, I, I hear where you're coming. It, it is very unlikely, but like I said, um, uh, at, uh, you, you know, coming from, a, a, a position where, where we will have a, a district where we will, we will have affordable housing. We will have an affordable housing project of some, uh, size on the flood school site. We will have a, a new affordable housing project, um, on, on the VA campus in, 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 in District 2. And again, going along Willow Road, again, there are the mid pin projects that, that are redeveloping. It's, it's hard for me then to, given that, not say that I'm willing to at least, even though it is, it is a, a um, not likely to, to, to say that, that that should be a site that, that we are going to provide certain incentives. And again, they, they might, they're, they're likely not to, to pan out, but, but I, I think, I think okay. it, it is, um, it, the, and, and, I, I think while, um, unlikely the, the, the probability isn't zero. All right. And, and just so I want to make clear, you guys also just as a separate, as a separate issue, because you first, you have the first issue of is good faith. Is it something that's HCD is going to accept and that everyone's going to accept is even feasible in the numbers. But the second issue is you guys actually think it's a good thing for the city of Menlo park that we would have venture capital firms redeveloped for affordable housing. So I would just like to make the comment that we're talking about a two acre carve out of a 6.8 acre site on one and a two acre carve out of a 10.9 acre site on the other. So perhaps they could coexist. I've spoken my piece on this and made my record. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Willison. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think what taking off, 
which I'm in favor of taking off the list. What taking off the list does to me is it tells me that we better talk to the Safeway Sharon Height owner and people a lot, find out what it's gonna take. It seems like that is is a is the opportunity site right now up in District Five in the Las Lomitas School District. We know we need to spread out um, the school districts as well. And if we're going to be removing, you know, this bunch of sandhill sites, um, we we definitely need to do our best on the sites that have any chance, real chance of redeveloping. Um, so to me, it just puts more pressure, and we really have to strengthen those policies and incentives. On, on the possible sites that are left. So that's all I have to say. Although I believe we had three votes to keep this on the site. Thank you. Uh, could we go to the next um, site, please? This again is in District 5. This is Stanford-owned site um, at Alpine Road and Stowe Lane. And staff has recommended remove it from the opportunity sites list. And um, the other option is to keep it on the opportunity sites list with the affordable housing overlay bonus. Councilmember Taylor, would you like to start off on this one? Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I I'm interested just in staff's feedback regarding why remove as far as the property owner stated the site has constraints such as drainage and accessibility. Is that something means that this is not a developable site? Developable site? Thank you. Uh, Council Member Taylor. So I, I think it would take a lot to redevelop the site. I think the issues that the property owner has mentioned, not only of the site constraints, the, the size for the density uh, proposed at 30 dwelling units to the acre, the, um, the potential conflicts that would uh, raise with the Stanford Golf Course. And so potentially a um, redevelopment when there's greater coordination between potentially the county, which is um, the Stanford area, which is in the county um, and this particular site, the adjacent properties, um, I think it would be a greater effort um, that would, uh, would require, redevelopment would require greater effort than um, I think what would be planned for this eight year planning cycle according to the um, property owner. One so last thing. Oh. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. And, and what's the zoning now? It's R1S, I believe. Single family residential. Thank you. I'm interested in keeping this side on with the housing overlay, affordable housing overlay. Thank you. Councilmember Combs. Yeah, yeah, I'm generally supportive. I mean, in the sense of that, that obviously property owners expressing that they're not interested in housing or they're not interested in redevelopment opportunities is not a the sole reason of which we remove something from the list. Like, and if that were the case, then there are a lot of things that are we're not even looking that we remove. And so, so here we essentially have a, a property owner saying that like that they're not interested in redeveloping it. But again, that's not single-handedly an element that we, we, we use to determine whether something should be on the list or not. And so in theory, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with keeping it on the list. Vice Mayor Willison. I'm going to lean towards keeping this one on the list <laughs> just because it, the property owner didn't say it's impossible. The constraints can be mitigated, although it does sound unlikely in this eight year cycle. But, um, oh, I was saying keeping it on the list. Um, again, 
this is where I really want to assign the probability, do a probability exercise. I don't think it's highly likely, but um, I'm okay keeping this one on the list. I would also keep it on the list um, under the, with the idea that it is unlikely that the property owner will go forward with it, but it is in the, um, excellent school district that I believe actually has capacity and um, I would keep it on the list. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this was one where I was gonna say, keep it on the list with the affordable housing bonus overlay because I think there actually is potential unlike the other one to actually have this built. Uh, Stanford is gonna have a general plan gut that it has to produce housing under and may look at this and decide to do it. So I was supportive of this one. I actually think it's kind of odd that there seemed to have been more discussion about whether this is feasible than the one prior. So this one makes sense. Thank you. And next um, we come to St. Bede's Church on Sand Hill Road. Um, this is another property that um, is being recommended for removal from the opportunity site. Um, the other option is to keep it on the opportunity sites with the affordable housing overlay bonus. Council Member Mueller, would you like to start off on this one? I personally don't think that either church is going to do this. So I was, I looked at both, I looked both at both Menlo Church and St. Beach Church and was perfectly fine with taking them off. So I, I just don't, I just don't see him doing it. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I was confused to see St. Bede's on this list because they had shown up at earlier housing element meetings expressing interest and kind of volunteering. So I'm curious um, if staff or, or Mr. Bradley, if you have any insight into what changed because I was like, they're one of the ones that are showing interest. Yeah. Um... Generally, we we treated churches uh, kind of separately from the rest of the sites because the, there's a new state law that provides some room for churches to add housing and not have to deal with the parking implications if they're using their parking lot. Um, but for churches that really proactively stepped forward and said, "Hey, no, we have we have an interest in this," then we uh, we I know St. Bede's Church definitely fell into that category because I had that same memory as you. Menlo Church, I would need to double check with my team uh, to make sure they had expressed interest. But generally, yeah, we didn't put churches on the list unless there was some proactive indication that they really wanted to be on the list. But then... But then they, but then upon further reflection and internal coordination, the church leadership said, no, 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 that's not something we want to do. Is my understanding. Can you review one more time what it means to stay on the list with a property owner that is not um, that is not expressed interest, but um, to keep it on the list with the affordable housing overlay, and to put it? What does that mean both for the property owner and what does it mean for our housing element? For the for the property owner, it doesn't implicate anything that they are doing or may plan to do under their existing zoning. Uh, no uses are being made non-conforming. Um, so th that's a common uh, misunderstanding uh, with when you see your, your property on a list for housing, some people assume, okay, the city wants me to stop doing what I'm doing and convert to housing. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a sort of permissive allowance that goes on top of, of what the existing zoning allowances are for. But, but that is something that we need to do a better job communicating. And for the city, so that's the implication for the owner. Um, for the, and some owners feel like the, it creates like some type of psychological or political pressure to do housing, even if there's not a hard technical zoning requirement. So that's, so that, that's just something to be aware of. It obviously um, can have implications. Um, and then for how it impacts the the city's document, I think we just have to be really clear. Um, if, we, if we feel like a site is a good housing site, 
So we have information in the record that the current ownership is is not interested in that. We have we have to be very cautious and conservative and reflect that in the in the in that chart that shows probability of development uh, within the planning period where those those adjustments can be made, including all the way down to zero in some cases. Thank you. That's, uh, but, <laughs> sorry, sometimes our titles get confusing here. Um, Mr. Bradley then, but currently the probabilities are not showing up in this current draft of the housing element. Is that correct? Asher, can you provide some more clarity around that? Because that example we looked at with the big five site, it looks like some version of that was happening on that second sheet. Sure. Um, so yeah, so it's, so yeah, um, I think earlier for sites like Big Five, um, we were thinking about um, having like this like 0% probability, but what happened is, um, this is actually really good things you brought up the Sacramento housing element, which is a good example of this. So HCD doesn't allow looking at the probability of a site developing, what they look at is um, the percentage of housing that could be built on a site. And they're really, um, frankly, confusing <laughs> things that um, HCV tries to like, draw this red line across very similar concepts. So what we were thinking on sites like this is that um, we can't say, oh, well, this is like, let's just say one acre site, 30 units per acre, but there's only a 10% chance of it being developed. Um, HC doesn't allow that sort of like probability of housing. And what they did in the uh, Sacramento example that I think you brought up is they said that um, of the development that we see happening on the site, there it is likely to be 20% housing versus for this other tier, it'll be 70% housing. So it's, it's slightly different concepts that sound super duper similar. Um, that there's been a lot of back and forth with. So when we talk about sites having a low probability of developing tonight, which is a lot of what you know we've been talking about for the past little bit, what we do when we're submitting the housing element is we're submitting here's the housing that we think will develop over the eight year time frame, um, parcel by parcel. And we're not allowed to say, um, oh, there's like a 40% probability on this side, a 60% on this site. Um, that's not something that HCD accepts. So what we're doing is um, showing the housing that could develop on these sites. And um, part of the reason that we have more is because um, we frankly don't know which sites would develop at 100% affordable housing. We don't know which ones would develop um, as market rate. We have a sense based on lots of conversations with affordable housing developers, um, other housing developers, other just real estate professionals who aren't in housing of what would go where. But um, what we're doing is, as uh, Jeff said earlier, casting this broad net so we can say, we think housing is gonna develop here and we, think these are all great sites for that. Um, we know, as I think Council Miller said, um, Mountain Park has a really strong track record of developing the sites and their site inventory. That's absolutely true. And as Jeff said earlier, the kind of interesting thing about this cycle is that we're looking at really developing affordable housing and really building up this policy framework to get affordable housing built with the caveat that um, we are not exactly sure which sites those are going to end up being. So um, hopefully that answers your question a bit um, of that sort of this um, kind of this thread that uh, HCD is requiring here. So, so are you saying then on page two of each of the site sheets, the number that it's showing will yield at each site has already been discounted by the prop. It's a double discount. So you guessed how many sites would develop and then you're also reducing it based on its probability of developing. 
I, I'm really struggling to understand why, like, I, I, I guess I can, I'll move on. I don't want to take, I, I'm just having a hard time having this make sense. <laughs> Cause it seems like the sites are either going to develop or they're not going to develop. And so discounting the site is kind of a fool's errand because it doesn't matter if it doesn't develop at all. I, I don't know. Um, I think what Asher is getting at Within the HCD manual, they actually have a guidance memo on this topic that they published in June of 2020. They actually have these little tables with the percentages. You're supposed to, supposed to example percentages uh, to indicate how the, how they look at the world. And basically, they don't want they don't want cities to assume that they're going to get 100% of the maximum density on every site, especially if if they have a track record of not getting that. Um, and so there's these adjustment factors, multiple adjustment factors for site constraints, for past um, planning approvals. So, you, so for example, you could have a one factor adjust it from 100% to 95% of the maximum density. And then another factor adjusts that number even lower uh, based on physical constraints. And so it, the numbers get chopped down quickly. Would are we damaging our or hurting our housing element by adding these sites, which we are hoping to incent affordable housing, but we believe it's unlikely. I think if we're if we're honest about the 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 expected yield coming out of some sites that we know are long shots, we're not, we're not damaging our credibility. If we're claiming big numbers from sites that HCD can see, or there's documentation in the record that uh, there's lack of owner interest, there's physical constraints, there's long-term leases, um, and, but we're still projecting a big number, that, that's, that's damaging to the overall effort. But if we're realistic about uh, just coming at it from a policy perspective and saying, hey, we see some long-term potential here, but we're being super realistic about what it's actually gonna happen during the eight years. Thank you. So I will say um, I am for keeping this on the opportunity sites list with the affordable housing overlay bonus as I have been with the others just in the chance that things may change over eight years. Council member Mule, uh, Combs. Yeah, and just so I'm understanding, is, is this the, the entirety of, of the, the property that St. Bede's controls or is it a carve out? Because it's only like a half an acre, but in some of the other ones, we specifically sort of have identified as it as a carve out. So, um, irrespective, this, I, I, no, um, please, I guess I did pose a question. I should, should wait for the answer. Sorry, Councilman Combs. Uh, yeah, this is, so the um, state law that Jeff Bradley mentioned earlier is about parking lots, and this is half of the parking lot on that site. For all the church sites, that's where that acreage comes from. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm supportive of keeping it on the, um, uh, the list, and, and why shouldn't we, like, sort of even expect more from some of our organizations of faith in, in connection with trying to solve, um, you know, the issue of, of housing affordability, like, right, why, what message does it send that we would remove them? And again, this isn't the entirety of the property, right? We're talking about just a portion of the parking lot, um, possibly being redeveloped. Um, you, you know, I would think it, it would seem, it would seem the wrong message if we're talking about like the message we send by possibly, you know, uh, thinking that uh, measure capital offices would be redeveloped. I think what message do we send by saying we're, we're not going to like sort of engage our, our organizations of faith in, 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 this, um, in this discussion about, about uh, producing more, more housing for our community? Can I just chime in? Because I'm sorry. First off, I, I don't think we've said that we think venture capital firms are going to redevelop. Uh, I think staff has said they don't think that's likely. But secondarily, if you guys have looked at St. Pete's Church, this is their parking lot. And it's on a hill next to two next to uh, Sand Hill Road. So if it's going to continue to operate as a church, I don't know where people are going to park. 
And that's probably why they don't want it. So, I mean, guys, like, I don't know this. I just, I, I don't see them ever doing this if they're going to continue to operate as a church. Uh, and if they want people of all abilities to be able to attend that church, they need their parking lot. And I think this does not, we are not requiring anyone to do that. We are just posing this as a potential site. Right. But the thing about it is that if you're going to oppose potential site, if you're going to propose potential sites, there has to be some basis in reality that they're of, of that they'll actually build that housing. And if they're telling us they're not, because it doesn't make sense with respect to the site for us to keep adding and including this isn't getting us any closer to the number. We're just doing things that make us feel good. Like we really should, if we're really serious about building, um, getting this affordable housing, we shouldn't go through this exercise and try to say, okay, well, there'll be a 10% allotment for that. And like, we'll add that. We should be really looking at sites and being, being scrupulous about will there actually be a housing built there? Because right now the exercise seems to be, well, let's do something that makes us feel good about that we said we'd do it there. That's not what this process is supposed to be about. We're wasting time actually trying to get to sites where we actually can build. These are the um, sites that were asked, that were um, highlighted by the staff from the planning and housing commission meetings. There is a long list of other sites that um, in the document and after we go through this, um, we could, if you want to call out any sites there, that is fine. But essentially, these are just a few of the sites that were in question. But these are the sites that professional staff has recommended they be removed. And we're saying, we'll just add them anyway. We'll just add them anyway. It's not realistic. Like, I, I mean, I still, I cannot believe that we're saying, I just, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll let it go. I've made my vote, but I, I can't believe that tomorrow there's going to be a housing element a draft housing amount release that says Menlo Park went over the objection of professional staff and is and is zoning, uh, proposing zoning Sand Hill Road for affordable housing. I can't believe that's going to be in the paper tomorrow. I can't believe that the people who live near Beach Church are going to think, well, okay, they think we're going to actually build over our parking lot. Like it makes a mockery of our draft housing element that we're actually intending to build these units. All right, so um, thank you. Vice Mayor Willison, I believe that you have not um, said <laughs> your vote on this one. Are you sure? H have I said what I think about this site? Okay, so I believe this was, um, correct me if I'm wrong then people, um, colleagues. I believe that there are four who are interested in keeping it on the site and um, I think I said, I, I think it's very unlikely, but I'm willing to I keep believe it on. We are, yes, that, okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So I will just, um, this is in district four. I, I would like to keep it on the opportunity list, um, sites list with the affordable housing overlay bonus. I'm seeing um, council member Combs nodding his head, other council member Taylor. I'm supportive. Council member Mueller. Unless the council is gonna change his position on downtown parking lots, I'm not. The property owner is not gonna, I don't believe the property owner will give up their parking lot and this council has taken a hard position against building parking lots. So they're not gonna get, so I think it's, I just don't think that they're telling us they're not gonna do it. So no, I'm not gonna, I'm, I am not gonna engage in a fiction in our housing element. Vice Mayor Wollison. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually gonna go, sorry, I'm gonna step backwards. I'm gonna go back to St. Bede's and actually take it off. And I'm gonna take this one off too. Um, with the, I think I'm being consistent, but if they said there's no way they're gonna do it, um, then, then I don't think it's, I, I'm really worried about being compliant with HCD. That's, that's where I'm coming from. So, um, and I, I think we're gonna have to go hard on the downtown parking lots. That's, that's where it's gonna be. And so um, I really wanna spend a lot of effort on those. All right, 
Um, I believe this still uh, council member Combs. Yeah, and, and my only question would be to the vice mayor is that we aren't though as a policy taking all of, all of the opportunity sites where the owner has said that they're not interested in it. And so until that, that's totally fine. I'm not saying well, that I, I have a position that's yeah. more logical than where you're at, but I'm just saying, just to be clear that like there are yeah. lots of properties that are still opportunity sites that we are not looking at that the owner has said that no way, no how, but they're still on there. That's actually a good point slash question. And so I would ask staff is the list of disinterested property owners is what you're showing us all of those who said no way, or are there more that we're not even seeing? I'm gonna look for some backup here from uh, M Group and city staff team members. But my my impression is that we haven't heard either way from from most of the property owners, from a majority of the property owners, um, and that this list is really a subset of sites that we, we, we've heard back from and they said, no, we're not interested. And there was some other public comment, commentary from the Housing Commission or the Planning Commission or from the public saying, hey, these sites are, are, are not great. So this could be our, I mean, potentially this could be the sum of all the sites that they've come out and said, we're not interested. Deanna, do you wanna take another? more accurate stab at that. Thanks, Jeff. I, I think what you said is, is accurate. So we haven't heard from the majority of the property owners, the ones that we have, uh, who have expressed disinterest, uh, an interest to, to develop housing um, are reflected here. And so if we hear back uh, from additional property owners, um, we can share that at uh, a future date with the, the city council. And this is not the final list. This is the list that's going through HCD at this time. And then we will still have another opportunity to look at it. Correct. So staff will um, put their heads together and their professional provide advice in the next round as well. Council member Taylor. Thank you. A quick question, Mayor Nash, and that is, are the parking lots on the list since it came up in conversation moments ago? So the idea was to quickly go through <laughs> these, but I think a lot of it is we're, um, we're actually getting, I'm hoping some basic ground rules so that others will be faster, but essentially we were, um, the plan was to go through these items that were called out by the Planning and Housing Commission, and then to open it up for other um, comments, such as on the parking lots, and also just generally to um, talk about the um, any comments people had on the policies. So I would, um, I believe that St. Bede's Church and Menlo Church, um, even with um, Vice Mayor Willison's um, changing her votes still go through um, this process. So let's, um, now I think we actually get to the- um, Mayor, that's just for uh, clarification on my record. We're saying that uh, references D site 40C and reference E site number six, which is St. Bede's and Menlo Church are being kept on the opportunities list with AHO bonus. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, um, we have the former flood school and staff's recommendation is keep on sites list, but limit density to 30 dwelling acres, dwelling units per acre minimum for HCD and do not apply the affordable housing overlay. Um, I would like some clarity, clarification, please on that. The thinking there is that the, the school district appears to have a very clear idea of what they would like to do there. It's another public agency um, uh, with a 30 dwelling units per acre. Uh, they could build 75 units on that site uh, with the application of a 20% density bonus, which is well within the 
standard state density bonus that generally goes up to 35, 50 percent. Uh, they could they could achieve the 80 to 90 90 units uh, on the site um, with that with that base density. So it's basically acknowledging that there's there's something happening there, and the the reason for the 100 dwelling units per acre allocation for the affordable housing zone was to incentivize an affordable 100% affordable housing development, and essentially that's already happening at pretty close to the to the base density in this case because of the public nature of the property owner, I would, I would put that forward as, as a, an assertion, not a fact, but that is definitely, a, 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 we've seen that as a key ingredient in, in a, making 100% a affordable housing projects work in a lot of cases. So given that we see evidence that something's working at, at 30 to 36 units per acre roughly, um, that's easily achievable under the the standard base density that the city has developed with the application of a a fairly routine uh, state density bonus application. That would be the best way to support the school district and what they're trying to do there and meet the city's housing goals. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor Nash. Uh, so, so Mr. Bradley, with the the sort of the state bonus, I mean, what then? What is the max number that they could get to at at the the base 30, 30 dwelling units and and whatever bonus they could get from the state uh, based on it being uh, all affordable housing? The absolute maximum under what I'm going to refer to as the the standard state density bonus generally maxes out at 50 dwelling units per acre. So that would be uh, 30, I'm gonna use 2.5 acres because I believe that's closer to what it is. Uh, so 75 times 1.5 would be 112 units. And then so- we, However, sorry. No, please go. Just full disclosure. There's also a newer state density bonus that could also go up to 80%. Um, so then why, since again, in this case, we, we know specifically um, the property owner and, and they have um, talked very publicly about a project that maxes 90, why wouldn't we essentially sort of, um, you know, architect this in a way that they could reach, they could reach 90 um, in, instead of 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 the the hundred and again not, not taking into account the potential eighty percent, um, but what we know they can max out with with the state bonus, because again that that would get them what the school district has said is the max of which they they want, um, and um, would that would that argue towards a lower density or a higher density? Well, well I'm asking. You, well, that would be lower, but I'm I, I don't know how you sort of how you walk that back, like as far as the base density to get to allowing them with whatever additional sort, sort of um, tools and programs that they can avail themselves of, but get, get them to 90, mm -hmm. which is what they've said publicly, that is the max number of units that they would be interested in putting on that site. Because again, obviously this, this is a site, and this is me obviously, but we'll see where the consensus of the council is. But but there has been a, obviously as you you know a lot of 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 talk about this site and, and uh, what is the, the 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 max amount of units that are thought that could go there or that there is a desire to 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 be there, and again I, I think we can have a debate about what's the right the right number and and certainly I think we as a community are headed towards that, but I'm like for the purposes here why don't we just sort of frame that at the max at which the property owner has said. That they're that they're most interested in 90 and for me i think that then that allows us as a city to have i, I think a, a um a, a debate that's a lot more clear um uh and and where there is a lot less sort of misinformation which has been the argument that there has been out there if we as a city come in and say hey the property owner has said that they want 90 or the 90 is the max and that we sort of um we in a way uh, uh, design this to where that they could at max get their 90, like, right? And again, that doesn't, um, for, for those people who have 
have issues with this project, that doesn't resolve their issues because there's, their issues is at the 90. But I think, like I said, that would allow us to have a as a community, a discussion about, a real discussion about what's possible there and remove this, this idea of, of 140 or 200. So just for example, to make sure we're talking about the same thing, if we said 20 units per acre times 2.5, that would be 50 units times an 80% density bonus would result in that 90 unit number. So you're talking about something in that direction? Yeah, so, so okay. then doing, doing 20 the, yeah, units an acre. Um, the council would definitely be within their rights to pursue that option. The only uh, caveat or I would offer would be that at that density, we couldn't actually count it as a 100% affordable housing project within the, the housing element. That it kind of is a mirror argument of, you know, just because a property owner may say they're not interested at this time in development doesn't automatically take it out. Just be, on the other hand, just because a property owner says, hey, I want to do 100% affordable housing, you can't just automatically plug that into the element because we have these default densities, right, that we love and hate that you know, if we hit if we hit that 30 units per acre, we can put it in the document as as affordable. At 20 units per acre, we can't. The thing that would change this whole dynamic was it was would be if the school district or their partner developer that they're working with filed an application, then we could treat it as a pipeline project, and we could do basically what you suggest, is sort of custom tailor it. Um, and if I may add to that. <clears throat> So there's two technical things that we need to do with HCD. One is have the appropriate density, which is 30 dwelling units per acre. And HCD has also said that we cannot rely on state density bonus to make, the, make up the units. But in this case, that, that shouldn't be determinative because of like what we said about all the other, that if you, you, could, you could dump all these sites on this list and you'd still be meeting your numbers. So, if we put if we put it at twenty units per acre, we would just take the hit on the density, and we wouldn't we wouldn't claim state density bonus because, like Sung said, under for obscure reasons, HCD doesn't allow you to sort of officially take credit for density bonus units because it's one hundred percent voluntary on the developer and the property owner if they decide to do that, and they don't like to see any indication that the numbers have somehow been built in to to include that even even though we can show a track record of density bonus projects. Um, but just so I can make sure I understand. So, so oh, e e even ahead. though like if um, at, at 20 uh, dwelling units an acre, it, it removes it from like an opportunity site. It, Te technically we could, we could count it as moderate income housing. Not, uh, uh, not very low, not low. Not market rate, but that that mid, that missing middle section of moderate income, based on that density. Based on that density, and then when, um, but but now at the current density, we're, we're counting it as what? At thirty dwelling units per acre or more, you it, it counts as one hundred percent affordable. But what level affordable? Because moderate is is half it in... half very low and half low. But but then we okay. Which again is an HCD state law thing yeah. that is doesn't meet the ground with any degree of reality but then when what is delivered let's say that there's no no very low like right it, it, it's only so, sort of moderate i mean if this is for for, for teacher housing I, I um i think the question would be like how many teachers would meet the low um, the, um as far as um um like household income um so if what gets delivered Let's say you keep it at thirty, and what's delivered is is is, is ends up being like one hundred percent moderate moderate uh, housing. How does that that get counted then? So, if I may, if, once it get once it gets built, it gets counted as of what's provided. So, okay. if the school just at the at the end of yeah. the day, the school district and their developer said this is all going to be moderate income yeah. housing because our teachers are what are yeah. paid at that level, and their household sizes are are, are, are fit that. Then yeah. that that's how they would be counted. And then and so in the same vein, like if we we lower this to twenty dwelling units an acre, right? Um, and then it it removes it from us getting certain to some degree it gets removed. But then if what is produced at the end is those ninety units, 
right, will get credit for those 90 units. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Vice Mayor Wollison. Yeah, I just have, um, Mr. Bradley, I think site 38, the site sheet is incorrect um, uh, on page two, because it's actually showing um, above moderate yield as the probable development. Um, so I think that might've been causing some confusion in the community as well. Um, if you look at site 38, it says, 10 low, 50 moderate, 25 above moderate. Whereas it sounds like the property owner has been very clear about 100% affordable. Sorry, I don't think we Councilwoman have... Wilson, I can speak to that um, as the person put together those said sheets. So we put that together. Uh, based on preliminary information that it was potentially something with that involved teacher housing. And as you said, there's a lot more um, information out now than when we put those together and we um, put this out. So it's something definitely that we can refine now that there's yeah, a lot more I, I clarity think that's really, on that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I also think that the district has been really clear that it's for um, some teacher housing, but it really it's staff housing for bus drivers, mm. cafeteria workers, custodians, uh, and the like. So that it could very well meet the low the low brackets. Thanks. Thank you for pointing that out. Councilmember Combs, would you like to suggest how you would like to have this on the list? Again, my suggestion would be that, um, yeah, that we, we, we don't um, um, apply affordable housing overlay and that we lower the density to 20 dwelling units an acre. My understanding is, again, that gets the, that still provides the optionality for the school district to get what it's saying is its project. Um, and again, I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that I am supportive of, of, of that project I, again as, as we all know it's not a project at the moment but what i'm saying i think it would help us as a community to frame exactly what we're talking about um when we as a city step in and and our role is is the ability to zone and saying that like the property owner has said that that the most that they would do is 90 and so let's let's cap the the option at at 90 um uh, 90 affordable housing units and and then and now we can we can have a debate about like whether um, whether that's the right the right number or not. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yeah, I have another question for Mr. Bradley. So, if hypothetically, if we were to do the twenty units an acre, we'd be using the state affordability, a state AHO, or the and not using the city one. Is that the proposal? Yeah. So, yes. So does the state affordable housing overlay come with um, different parking requirements potentially than, than a local one? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I'm going to look to the city attorney because I'm struggling to find the most up-to-date version. The, um, the state density bonus law. The state density bonus laws allow for certain waivers of um, parking requirements as there's parking specific incentives that go along with density bonus. So if a project qualifies for a density bonus, they're permitted certain waivers of parking um, depending on the project proposed. I, on <laughs> I think you, um... I think I zoned out to be perfectly honest. We've been going three hours, uh, 20 minutes straight. I apologize, city attorney, can so, you repeat so, that? Yeah, so if a project qualifies for a state density bonus, whereas here the hypothetical is they'd get 20 um, dwelling units an acre base, and then they can go up depending on the um, level of affordability and number of affordable units that they propose. Um, anytime any project qualifies for any density bonus, there are also parking waivers available um, to the project proponent such that certain 
that local parking standards could be waived depending on the type of project. And I can get into the specifics, but I do have to look at the state laws to articulate precisely what the park what parking waivers would apply. Under I think scenarios. I found it, Nira, if I may. It looks like rental rental for sale projects with at least eleven percent very low income or twenty percent lower income within a half mile of major transit stop, half one half space per unit. But if it's not within a major transit stop, it's on a sliding scale based on bedroom counts from one space up to two and a half spaces per unit. That's right. And cities are limited in the maximum parking requirements that they can impose for density bonus projects. So there's um, a maximum of one space for studios and one bedrooms and one and a half spaces for two and three bedrooms and two and a half for four bedrooms. And those would override any local parking requirements. I think I'm actually thinking the other way it, on the minimums. So are there higher minimums for the state than what we may be considering for our local AHO? No, the state doesn't mandate a certain number of parking spaces per unit or per project. They limit the city's ability to impose parking requirements. Well, I will, um, I appreciate uh, Council Member Combs's insight into the project and um, would vote for what you have said. Um, and I'm hoping someone has that down, but I'm wondering if there's um, what others are thinking. Council Member, uh, Council Member Mueller. I'd like to wait to hear from Council Member Taylor. Mayor Nash at this time, I don't have any input. Okay, we need to get five opinions, please, on the former flood school site. I'm waiting to hear from the people whose district's closest to us, mine is furthest away. So that's why I said I'd like to hear from Council Member Taylor. Uh, I, that was I, not I, directed I, at you, that okay. was generally. <laughs> Okay, but what I will say, what I will say is, and I haven't decided what I'm doing yet, but I find it completely odd that on the sites where they're telling us they won't develop, and it's completely infeasible, we are maximizing the units per acre and doing an affordable housing overlay. And in the one site in the city where they tell us they will develop, we're decreasing the units per acre and getting rid of the affordable housing overlay. And in the one site where the developer said, well, they'd be interested at a certain density, no one was interested in the density and took it off. I have no idea how we're ever gonna hit our number. I will make one comment regarding your comment. And that is that the, I believe that the, Mr. Bohannon was looking to increase the density for market rate, and that was not for affordable. Had it been for, and if we find out that it is for affordable, I would absolutely support an increase. I spoke to a lot more than that, but I appreciate that, Mayor, Mayor Nash. Council Member Combs. Again, I'll, I'll just say like, uh, I, I think that there is much discussion to be had um, at, at the 90 units, like right? Um, and and I, I'm making it very clear, I'm not expressing support for that. Um, what I'm trying to do uh, with regards to, to this particular situation is that we have an owner who have said that that's the max of what they want to do. And so I'm saying, since there is a lot of discussion and I think misinformation about what, what the number of units could go at the site, even as the property owner has said that they won't do higher than 90, um, th then I'm saying, let's sort of as, in our role as a city say, okay, we'll take you at your word, you set 90, we'll cap it at 90 as the option. And then we can have a discussion as a community um, about what might be the most appropriate density. 
Um, but giving the developer everything that they asked for, essentially, that this doesn't take anything away at this moment. And and I feel like I'm I feel like I am going a long ways, again, <laughs> um, in a direction that uh, um, uh, a lot of my constituents have very con a lot of concerns about. But I think I'm going in a way to say, hey, let's let's at least sort of operate and have this discussion in the realm of reality. And yeah. and so and again, if the if the school district was saying like no, we think we can do 200 units at that site, then we would have that discussion, like, right? Um, and I wouldn't be saying what I'm but, saying now. But every other site, I would point out to my colleagues, they've said, let's incent. Oh, Bede St. Speeds doesn't do it, let's incent. Oh, this site doesn't wanna do it, let's incent. But this site, no, 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 no. We're gonna be, this site actually wants to build, we're gonna decrease. We're gonna decrease the acreage. What do you propose? Uh, Give I'm us just, an option, I, please. I, 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 I'm actually, what I propose is we start over and deal with the reality of, of what we're actually trying to accomplish. Because right now, I don't think we're trying to accomplish a housing element. Where people actually want to build, we're trying to take it away. Where people don't want to build, we're trying to add. I, I don't understand what we're doing. So, so my I big would... problem with this site, with the former flood school site right now that I'd say to the school district is I don't know why you're using a for-profit developer for an affordable housing project. I don't know why they're doing that if they want to make it market feasible because that's a, that's affecting the project. But and so that's you know I appreciate what you guys are trying to do to be responsive, but I'm just I'm having a hard time following the logic of the council of how it's applying it to this housing element because we're again where we have a site where someone wants to build we're lowering the acre, the acre, the units per acre, per acre we are uh, not putting affordable housing overlay. And then where we have people who don't want to develop at all on sites that are completely infeasible, like Sand Hill Road, we're saying maximize it all the way and maybe we'll get credit for it. And that is not going to help us get units. What, what we're trying to do right now is get our housing element done. Actually, I will. We are not trying to get credit for these developments. What we're trying to do is to see if there's any way to incent them in the future. It's not a matter of whether or not we get credit at HCD. Otherwise, we would be taking a different approach. We are trying to see whether or not we can actually get affordable housing in Menlo Park beyond what is being built in the Bayfront area. And I would welcome suggestions as to how we go about doing that. Um, Vice Mayor Willison. Uh, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I think with site 38, um, I know we're meeting tonight and we're submitting to HCD, you know, imminently, but I, I feel like someone, I, I feel like because the developers expressed interest before we, I understand what you're trying to accomplish, um, Council Member Combs, in kind of ending some of the possible things that are flying around with 260 units and 120 units and and really having a conversation around 90. Um, and so I'm not opposed to the suggestion, but I feel like we should do a gut check with the district and the, the property owner. I don't know if we have the time before we submit this draft, but I'd feel a lot more comfortable with this site um, doing that because if it makes if there's something that we're not looking at in terms of how the the site and where they're thinking of putting it and how it it does something I, I don't know enough about zoning to know if there's some unintended consequence of of doing that that would make it infeasible I'm not saying I want to go above the 90 I really think first of all that the school district is is acting in good faith and that I don't think they have any intention to go above 90 as a cap they've said it over and over again and I'm willing to do something that makes the community, some members of the community feel you know, better about a certain cap, but I think it's be a courtesy, courtesy to the property owner just to run this by them to get their feedback. That's what I would say. So I, I just have to chime in there. It's like the property owner has expressed a number of times in public, in emails to individual residents, that the most that they want to build is 90. And to Council Member Mueller's point, they have engaged a professional developer um, who's done an analysis of the site. And so if we engage them and they come back with some number other than 90, then there is gonna be a complete loss of trust. 
there, there's going to be a complete loss of trust. And, and, and that yeah, initiative no, I, that's coming, coming our way is going to be really interesting. Yeah, so they, I, I they have said like, like dozens of no, times I, I that 90 is the cap. I think 90 is the cap, but I also don't think in the recommendations here, any of the possibilities was going under, under 20, uh, under 30. So I think it's a courtesy. I just want staff maybe to vet it. I just want to make sure there's nothing, there's nothing in there that we could regret or, or something that I'm not seeing now. So uh, I'm fine. I'll support the 90. That's fine. I'll support what you guys want to do. But I think it's, I'm telling you, I do not get the logic at all of what, how you're approaching this. I'll do it because you guys, I'll do it because it's apparent you guys want to do this to go ahead and well, frame. Council Member Mueller, my logic is that in this moment, I'm allowing the property owner no. to exploit the property to the extent I'm allowing but the not option. anywhere else but not anywhere else for this property owner in your district it's very important what their intent is but nowhere else because this is the one that's likely to be built this is exactly the one, this is the one exactly this because is, this is the one that's likely to be built we have to limit it but nowhere else we want to incent them to create as much as possible though they have no incent by they the have property no intention owner that to do so own, that by the property owner that currently owns it who is saying that has given us a very specific number i am saying again I am not supportive of 90 units. I am just trying to frame a debate, um, a discussion. But uh, that is not the so point. I, I the will, point of a housing element is not to frame the debate around uh, uh, an initiative process. If you guys okay. want to go, what I don't understand is what we're trying to do is look at what the intent, if, well, in this circumstance, it's very important to you guys what the intent of the owner is, but it's not in the other properties. And what you're saying is because their intent here is actually to build, we must limit it. But where people have told you they have no intent to build, we must go ahead and in that circumstance, offer as much as we can, even though they're never going to build it. It makes no sense. We're not, it doesn't help us. Thank you. Yeah. Council member Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Nash. And I hope that we are not about to go back to a discussion from public comment um, again, um, but I did hear what the district's request was and I'm supportive of the 90 units so that we can move on to the other sites. I don't know if we're halfway done um, and we're nearing three and a half hours in the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Combs. And can I just say to, to uh, um, uh, and, and I think I have the support on this. So, but to, to Council uh, Vice Mayor Willison's concern, obviously, if there is some issue here, this is a draft, and and and, and if there is some 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 weakness that that we're not seeing that that further limits, I would imagine because again, okay, that's that's fair enough. Again, I mean, you have me because <laughs> again, I'm not not a fan of ninety, so I'm, I'm not I'm not. Uh, given that it's a draft, I, yeah. I feel um, I appreciate that point made and. Um, Let's move on. Yeah. And I want to just respect Council Member Mueller's comments. Just we're trying to move um, at 930 at night through the rest of the document. Um, so um, Mayor Nash, just for, again, just clarity, um, confirming that we're limiting the density to 20 dwelling units per acre and not applying the, H, the AHO. Is that correct, Council Member Combs? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mayor Nash. Yes. I do want to caution that <laughs> this might be to Mayor Mueller, uh, not Mayor Mueller, Council Member Mueller's point. It does give me a little bit of concern that we are, we're making kind of this one-off decision where we're going to apply the AHO probably to every site except for this one. And that if we have other sites that then show that they're likely to develop and we get neighborhood or some resident feedback that they don't want it, that I just think we might be setting a precedent. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash for acknowledging me. I was going to follow up with Vice Mayor Willison's comment, but I will move on. Thank you. And I wish we had more time to discuss these. I, I thank you. Um, USGS is, um, I actually have a question right off and that is why it is listed as five acres, um, when it is actually 17 acres. And if we could get some clarity around that 
and then the recommendation is to keep on opportunity sites list and increase densities on site. And I also would like some clarification um, whether or not we in fact have accounted for a 10 acre school site on that site. Thank you. Thanks, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so since we were so focused on affordable housing, we really took to heart some of the guidance um, regarding site size. Sites that are too small are not viable for affordable housing developments generally, and sites that are too large are, are equally difficult for affordable housing developers to take down and develop within their financing limitations and project management size that they go for. And so there's a couple of different data points here. HCD says basically any site less than an acre is, is not viable. Asher, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe half acre. And then anything up to 10 acres, over 10 acres is too big. And so we- um, so and then Quickly correct, it is a half acre. Half acre, thank you. And then the local nonprofit developer community kind of zeroed in on that even further and said they're really, their sweet spot is one to two acres. Due to the high land costs, anything bigger than that is it just throws off their pro forma. So I'm gonna summarize it that way. Um, and so we really focused on these carve outs of, of smaller sites, large, sorry, larger, large, smaller sites within larger sites. Um, and so in this case with the 17 acre site, we kind of stretched that and, and essentially created two carve outs, one of two acres and, and one of three acres. So we have sort of expanded it beyond the other carve outs you've seen on some of the other sites. That was, that was, that was the rationale around it. And I don't believe we've officially designated any public school site on this site or any other site. Is that correct, Asher Sung? That is correct. Could there be, um, is there a staff comment about um, whether or not, I don't think anything's public, um, officially designated, but is, could we get a status of where, what is the status of the school site, a possible school site of 10 acres, I believe is what we were talking about. Uh, let's see, this is, uh, <clears throat> Justin, I, I'll take a st initial stab at that. I believe the council did deliberate that in the fall. I believe that is um, <clears throat> a record and we can double check the minutes, but I think that is something we need to find a way to fold into this draft housing element before we submit it to the state. Cause I, I believe that is the council's uh, direction. I can get you the specific date in a little bit if you'd like of, of when the council deliberated that. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Willison, this is in your district. Would you like to take a first shot at this? Um, I'm curious when it says increase densities on site, did you have, is this reflecting that or are you proposing additional density? Asher, can you clarify that for us? Thanks, Jeff. I, I can, I think, chime in here. Thank you, Vice Mayor Wilson. So I think we were looking uh, originally to study the density about 40 dwellings to the acre, which would be similar to what was um, originally proposed at SRI um, or the Parkline development adjacent to this site looking at um, increasing densities were heard that this could be um, a great opportunity site. Um, and so in its particular um, with respect to its proximity to services and transit. And so increasing the density is an option here to something greater than 40 dwelling to the acre. We recently heard that Parkline is considering a variant in their EIR as an alternative to explore up to 600 housing units at the site. So approximately 60 dwelling to the acre. And so wanted to bring that forward to the city council if that's something that they would like to also see at this particular site um, to increase the number of units um, studied. And um, I apologize for not knowing this site number. Is Where is the location of the base of the two acre carve out for the hundred units an acre and the three unit 
three acres for the 40 units because I feel like if a site um, is deep inside of a campus where it's not abutting, um, you know, people's homes directly, I'm much more comfortable um, with more height and density versus it being in, in someone's backyard. So um, I, I'm supportive of, of increasing the density um, there um, up to potentially, you know, 60 units an acre. Um, are, are you suggesting more of our affordable, more afford, our affordable housing overlay is our affordable housing overlay. So we're not looking to increase that. So I guess um, with the, because one of our strategies was to have a big delta and the rest of the housing element, we have a, quite a large delta between the base and the affordable housing overlay. So what does that do then when we don't have that delta? Um, and how does this fit in with potentially the 10 acres you know, for the school and I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing the pic big picture here. So I believe the carve out is a floating carve out. It's not tied to any specific geography other than the large site area. And I'm happy to be corrected if this case is different. That's generally how the carve outs work. Um, and I believe the 40 dwelling units per acre is what we have currently, right? Sung and Asher? Or are we increasing from 30 to 40 as part of this recommendation? So currently it's um, zoned public facilities, I believe. Um, it's not currently zoned for housing. But and, within, um, within, the, within, the, within the existing draft housing element? Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so within the existing draft, it's 40. It's 40, not, yeah. not 30. Yeah, so we'd be, um, I was saying, as Deanna said, increasing from 40 upwards, potentially. From 40 to, to what? Upwards, I mean, that's the oh, just, discussion. Okay, so currently it's at 40 within the housing element. And it, it's, it's eligible for the 100 dwelling years per acre. So that's, that's sort of the existing Okay, wait a minute, framework. now I'm getting confused on the site sheets again, because on page one for site 12, it's saying 30 units an acre. Yeah, is it, is it 30 or 40, yeah, sure. It's for this is another issue we had, uh, you know, moving information as the site sheet was uh, published where we learned about the um, potential density increase since publishing the draft. And then um, between, again, similar to what we discussed so before. The, site, um, short, the short version is the site sheet is incorrect. And the, yeah. this table we're looking at is, is the correct information currently. So, That's we, the correct. so we're showing this is 40 units per acre. The recommendation is simply that the council could it consider increasing that. Uh, to your point about what's the, what's the whole master plan here. If, if the direction from the council previously, which I'm also remembering, um, was to was to designate a 10 acre school site. There's probably no reason why the remaining seven acres shouldn't all go to housing. Possibly, and then do a carve out of five acres for the affordable housing overlay. So so there's an auction that's about to take place <laughs> for, for this site that's been publicized. And I've actually spoken to a couple developers um, who over the last like, year or so who have expressed interest. And it sounds like there's a desire to retain some of the office, the, the newer, there's like two newer office oh, buildings. That's right. um, so I'm confused about that. And then I'm also confused whether the auction, people bidding on the auction have been informed of these zoning signals that we've been signaling. Um, so th this site just, I'm just a little confused about, um, but I guess that's not the question for tonight. So did I answer Mayor Nash, your question about 
what you wanted me to opine about the site? So actually I'm trying to figure out if um, keep on opportunity sites list and increase densities on site, keep on opportunity site list with the affordable housing overlay bonus. So I guess I want the first one and the second one, I guess I want there to be higher I think 40 is too small. And I say that with knowing that there's people in my district who aren't gonna to wanna to hear that. Um, but I, I think that we're the district that's closest to, you know, downtown, the, the high school, the, you know, I, I acknowledge where we live in, in the city. And that, you know, I think we're gonna need all kinds of mitigations on transportation and, and, and different things. Um, so I just want to put a pin in that, um, but that I, I think we need the sites that are going likely to develop and the sites being sold. So someone's going to buy it and they're going to want to develop. We need to be realistic and, and do what we need to do on those sites. So uh, Mayor Nash, did I, so I guess I want both increase the density and to use the AHO bonus because it's two different, it's really two different carve outs with two different things going on. Councilmember Combs. Just a question. You're saying so increase the base density, right? To what? So I was thinking around 60 then. I, I'm curious what my colleagues think. I will say I'm curious um, how this plays into market rate versus affordable. Yeah, I mean, as we as we increase the base density, um, regardless of affordability, there will be a higher likelihood that it would be developed with with market rate housing. Okay, wait, so, so then I reverse course <laughs> and actually want to lower the density. But I, is it possible if we're carving out two separate things? Yeah. And on one of the things we have the thirty and the hundred, and the other thing go up to sixty, so that we're planning on half of the carve outs going, or or maybe we have it all affordable. I, 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 I think I might need a break soon. Yeah. Actually, um, yes, we're planning a break after, right after this, but if we need to, we could do it. Actually, why don't we take a break now? And I'm trying to figure out how many minutes. Why don't we, given how much we have, why don't we come back at um, 9.55 in six minutes? Thank you.
having the quorum of our city council return to our virtual and in-person dais. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you very much. And council member Mueller has some questions for staff. I just wanted to ask and just to clarify, when we pass uh, the housing element, we are actually doing a rezoning in the city. Is that correct? No, the housing element in itself is a, is a policy document uh, that controls the, the general plan level land use designations for, for the housing sites, but the actual zoning implementation uh, is separate from adopting the housing element. Do we adopt them at the same time, the zoning changes with the housing element? Ideally, and the current work plan calls for the zoning changes to be uh, developed concurrently with housing element so that yes, the council would adopt the, the implementing zoning changes at the same time. All right, so when we look at these, I dock these uh, different sites tonight, there'll be accompanying zoning that will change for those sites, correct? That's anticipated. Some, some of them, yes. So for instance, on Sand Hill Road, we're actually talking about rezoning four acres of land from office to housing. I'm gonna reach out to uh, the, the Assistant Community Development Director for more clarity on, on the zoning tool that would be utilized to accomplish that. Great, thank you, Council Member Mueller. So yes, with all of our housing sites, they would uh, either likely take the form of rezoning from uh, something that potentially doesn't allow for residential uses to residential uses or looking at potentially a zoning code amendment, which if it's site already say, for example, in the specific plan allows for a residential use to change the zoning so that it would allow a potentially higher density use. So each of the sites that have been identified would be uh, either rezoned um, to allow for residential uses or uh, be the benefit of a zoning change that would allow for something higher. So with respect to the Sand Hill Road sites, those sites currently do not allow for residential uses. And so there would be a need to rezone to allow for such a use. And if you were one of those office buildings after the rezoning took place, would you be, uh, would you have to would you be allowed to, you'd have to go through a special process, I guess, or a variance if you wanted to do anything with respect to adding density for your office there, because now you're zoned residential, correct? It, it would depend, I think, on what the zoning designation would allow for. So if, um, say, for example, many of the sites might be developed at their maximum uh, floor area ratio today. So uh, any change in development and redevelopment of the site could either trigger um, conformance to, would, would, would re typically require conformance to the new zoning designation. So if that designation allows for office, it could rebuild back office. If it allows for only residential, it would need to rezone or rebuild with residential, or it could be allowed for a mix of uses. So it would need to, um, we would look to the zoning and how it's set up to identify how the site could be used in the future. I think Mr. Bradley mentioned that um, existing uses could remain and that's generally how it is, you know, an existing use could, could remain um, as is, um, but future redevelopment would need to conform with the, the zoning designation. And if those buildings meet, met the, the uh, became so old that they were no longer fees, no longer feasible and need to be needed to be rebuilt or met or, or met the the end of their natural life as happens with buildings, they would they couldn't be rebuilt as office. They'd have to be rebuilt residential because they would be if, rezoned that way. If it was structured in that way, yes. So in essence, we're whether it happens eight years from now or not, we're rezoning this land to residential from office on Sand Hill Road. Yes, we are. That's just what the test of, that's just what was said. We'll be, we're rezoning four acres from office to residential. So thank you for that. Again, I just would say to my colleagues, Excuse I me. do not believe we should be we should be making these zoning changes on Sand Hill Road. The, the uh, property owners have indicated they do not intend to build housing. And I think it's not in the best interest of the city to be rezoning office on Sand Hill Road to housing. 
as and especially as these owners have no interest in doing it and in essence over the period of over time what was happening is we are locking them into having to either be in obsolete buildings or having to build housing and i don't believe that's just in the best interest of the city sand hill road is the venture capital cap venture capital destination of the world and that has benefited both menlo park and the rest of the silicon valley for generations. And I have no idea why we're doing this tonight or proposing that it be done, especially as no one's indicated, as its professional staff has indicated they wanted it, they were recommending it be removed from the property list. And the property owners say they're not going to build affordable housing in this cycle. But I've made so my argument and I will let it go there. I just wanted to make it very clear for the record what, what in case my colleagues hadn't, hadn't considered that it's not just that we're putting it in the housing element. We are actually change, We are actually going to be asking staff to change the zoning for these parcels. City Manager Murphy. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Mayor Nash. I did just want to um, um, amplify and uh, a little bit about what. Um, Ms. Ms. Chow was talking about because I just want to make sure again in the, in this uh, hybrid setting that uh, people are able to um, fully uh, understand each other. And Ms. Chow, feel free to chime in after I speak in case I miss uh, speak on anything. But uh, I I know that she was fielding a number of questions about some um, uh, what some next steps would be and uh, some what the future zoning may be. I believe that there, it, it kind of, it depends, the specifics of what any future rezoning would be, would be dependent on the council direction at that time. And so she outlined a few different options of how this could be done. Um, the part that I wanted to really focus in on is um, the bit that um, said that, uh, I believe there wasn't really uh, an option that a lot would allow, um, sorry, I believe that there is an option that would allow the existing uses to remain, to be redeveloped as is, and fold in the option of residential in addition to what they have. So that level of detail could be worked out in future months, if that's the desire of the council. We're not at that stage right now. So the specifics of what the future zoning would be is for a different, a different discussion. So City Manager Murphy, are you suggesting that this would be zoned mixed use? Um, that, that could be one of the options. That's what I'm, I, I think there's a, 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 a um, spectrum of options that could accommodate it. Um, I, I don't believe I'm also looking across the way at Mr. Bradley in case there's anything else that's been discussed that I haven't been uh, privy to up to this point, but I think there's a number of options for how to potentially achieve those objectives of housing and uh, office on those sites. Um, and so there are a few different options and we, we'd well, be happy to put together at a future date what those various options are. I'm not sure if those have been fully I'd, I'd appreciate that, City Manager Murphy, because the, the term that's put in here is a carve out of 2.2 .2 acres, not an additional, but a carve out. So reading it that way, that would mean that two acres would be carved out from the office zoning, which is there now and be converted to residential. So if something different is being proposed, that's not what's in the grid. And I appreciate that in terms of some of the terminology. Um, and I, I believe um, some of the carve outs and as expressed previously on USGS are some, sometimes floating in terms of exactly where they would be. So we can work on that terminology um, and, uh, and report back to the council on that. And I would also, um, add that I believe I speak for all my colleagues when I say that there is no intent to change the current use of Sand Hill Road. I think everybody respects what um, work is done there and um, that is not the intent. The intent is to try and get affordable housing in Menlo Park. And also this is a draft at this point, we are still going to get another view of it. So we are not making any 
Mayor Nash, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the logic there because the intent is to change the use of Sand Hill Road to as residential to this area. That is what is being directed tonight. So I, I again, to I add just, but not substitute. Okay. Well, again, I, 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 I don't think in the terms of in the context of the housing element, the owners have said they're not going to do it. So I, I do take some solace in the facts that we're not getting, we're not that there is the possibility that the continued that the current use won't be impacted by the rezoning but i do think it's not in furtherance of the housing element to be doing this thank you um to go back to the usgs and um where we are vice mayor willison yeah mayor nash i think you're gonna kill me but i had a thought i, I have a question about a, a previous site but I just want to check in with, I don't know what our direction was. Actually, can we finish this before okay. we go That's to, fine. um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it look, so I'm, I'm still very, I'm not, I took my break, but I'm still confused on what the staff recommendation is, um, on USGS. So Mr. Bradley, I'm counting on you. What, what is staff's recommendation here? Correct me if I'm wrong, Deanna, but I think we were, um, channeling some of the feedback we're getting from the community and the housing commission and some of the housing advocates that, hey, you have a 17 acre US government owned site, it's going up for auction. Why aren't you leaning into that more? More housing, more density, more of that. Um, so our recommendation is for the council is at least consider that input uh, at this point and let us know if we've been too timid on only tagging five acres out of 17, understanding that we need to indicate 10 acres for, for public school within this, this document or some other appropriate place in the general plan. Um, so we, we sort of acknowledging that, that yes, this is, this is happening. This is a significant property and maybe um, you know, more housing could be planned at this location. Okay, I, I think that the priority from my perspective for this site is, uh, you know, I'm a big, I know we have a huge need for housing and affordable housing, but um, I think the school district has made it very clear that they're concerned about having capacity, site capacity for potentially their increasing enrollment with all this new housing. And so I would prioritize, again, I don't know what, with this auction and where this process is, but I actually in, in this case, I think the, the school site, like I, I don't see a world where that we take 17 acres, we say we want 10 for a school, five for affordable housing, you know, and then the developer who just paid $150 million or whatever has like two acres or something. So that's where I'm, I'm like head scratching. So I think if the school site takes priority. And then I, I'm curious to hear from my colleagues what their suggestions are uh, beyond that. Is anyone interested in adding to this at this point? So, um... Where are we at uh, with the sort of designation as a portion of this being utilized for a school? Like, where does that that actually exist? I, I can promise you that, like, I think to yeah, what is the the start the the auction starting price is a hundred million dollars or something? A hundred. I, I imagine no one's paying that based on the idea that. And so where are we at with that? Like, um, <laughs> so, so, so just for the, through the mayor, for the benefit of the people watching at home, the council member Combs is looking at me. So I, I'll take the first stab at that. But I did look back at the record and it was the council meeting of December 8th, where the council uh, did record um, its, its desire for uh, how to approach um, that site. And this site is currently zoned public facilities. So whoever purchases the property needs to come to the city to mm -hmm. seek, seek rezoning. So that's where the city has, has the, um, the power of zoning. 
and um, I, I believe it was, I can cross check, but I believe it was unanimous at the time that the, there was council support for that. So that's, um, uh, that's kind of step one. And uh, I, I, we will see how, how it goes with um, who the successful bidder is and how they approach the city. I think if, if the successful bidder has been listening and paying attention to what's been going on in the city over the past year, they may be able to come up with creative solutions that accomplish that win-win-win um, for how to um, preserve options for the educational uses. Um, uh, on that site, because as you may recall, there's an existing uh, preschool that's on the site that uh, not looking to kind of displace that as well. There are some existing substantial buildings that frankly may be able to be repurposed, reused in as some educational capacity. So I think as long as the city is signaling what's important to, to us and the community, that's the most important thing. Uh, but also give uh, the prospective buyers some flexibility about how to approach it. So that's where our it may, uh, may indeed be beneficial to not identify the remaining seven acres all for residential. It may provide a, a little bit of flexibility because I think it'd be ideal that there's some mix of uses on the site. I, I, I am, I'm supportive of the direction that, that the vice mayor is going in. I would agree. Council Member Mueller. Excuse me, if you, if you don't mind, Councilmember Taylor had her hand up. Thank you. I'm supportive as well, Mayor Nash. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. And to be clear, that's to increase the acreage, the units per acre to 60 still? No, it was to prioritize. I would look for staff, given that we want to prioritize your idea, Councilmember Mueller, back in December of designated, designating, designating, it's getting late, about 10 acres for some type of school site or something around there. So if we want that and we want someone to buy it and want to help us and do that, what's the amount of housing we think we, is reasonable to zone for there? That's fine. The, my biggest concern with this site is obviously getting the housing, but I, I do very much want to make sure we have the school site. Yeah, I think that's what we're all in agreement on. All right, thank you. So I would look to staff then maybe to make a recommendation. Um, well, in terms of a, a balance or a mix of uses, we have just in the table in front of us in this attachment, we have two acres identified at 100 billion units per acre. So that's, that's the affordable portion. And then an additional three acres at 40, doing units per acre, which could be considered market rate based on everything we've been talking about. And that's a total of 320 units. And then you have a 10 acre school. And so you'd have, that's 15 acres total spoken for. And then you'd have two acres left over for some buildings that could be repurposed or kept as, as office space. So there'd be a lot of different things going on there, but it all seems like it would, it would fit. Uh, Mr. Bradley, if, if we do that today and then someone purchases the property in the next couple months mm -hmm. and they come to us and say, to, to get that school site, we're going to need X density or X zoning, will we have an opportunity since this is still in draft mode? Could the timing work where we can kind of see what happens a little bit and discuss it? Probably not. <laughs> if you're talk, talking about like a lot, a lot more housing, like higher densities all around from the new develop from the new owner for USGS. Yeah, we said that if it goes through an auction and you have a new owner who says, "Okay, fine, you want ten acres for a school, you need to give me, you know, two thousand units or whatever." Is that a type of negotiation you're talking about? Well, I wasn't going that high. <laughs> <laughs> Or bigger, a bigger number. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, mean to a bigger number. Or the alarmist. This about is what it. it would take on this site to yeah. yield this this site, the school site that you guys want. Because basically, we're asking them to dedicate. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a pro forma where they have to calculate the benefit they're giving. And this is a this is a public uh, elementary school we're talking about, essentially, right? K, K through five or six. I believe 
type of thing. The, the, the district has been talking about needing a middle school. I think there's a lot of unknowns, I Good. guess. Okay. I think we're struggling here with the exact direction to give. Well, the staff recommendation is to ask for direction if you'd want to increase the density or not. So if, if the increase in density is incremental along the lines of what you've been talking about, 40 to 60, that kind of thing, we could probably absorb that within the existing environmental analysis. If it's a big, big number, big increase, we'd probably have to rework the, the traffic analysis. So there's, there's, a, some sensi there's some sensitivity there between small changes versus large changes. And what we're talking about is they would need to go through an additional EIR. Correct. So we're not saying that it couldn't happen. It just would, if they're not. Right, it might not happen all as part of this, this process we're in right now. I mean, that seems reasonable since we can't read the tea leaves. Yeah, okay, thank you. City Clerk Karen, do you need any clarification? So just again, thank you for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we including the AHO bonus or not? Yes, okay. And then are we designating acreage for school? Yes. Perfect, thank you, I'm clear. No, designating, not dedicating. Designating. But are, can we zone for non-housing right now? Or is it just signaling again? Or not literally zone? How about how with staff decides how they work it out? Yeah, I think that's gonna be a whole another work item is to figure out all the details around the The zoning. intention is there. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Willison, did you want to return to the item that you were talking about? Thank you, Mayor Nash. Okay, I hate to bring up Site 38 again. I just want clarification. I know we said 90, and we were going with the 20 units an acre. Were we going with the moderate? So it I wanted to know, what is it counting for the housing element or not counting for the housing element? Because I thought if we do 20 units an acre, we could do moderate. That's affordability correct. level, so it could count. That's correct. Okay, is that was that the direction that you're going with? Yes. Okay, that that I'm comfortable well, with that. Thank you. Let me check my notes. That's, is that what the city clerk has? Twenty years Prager. I have yeah, I have twenty. Do you bash AC? Yes, thank you. But I think the idea here is that like um, we're going to get credit for the units produced, right? Because because I, I, I agree, but at the end of the day, too, we have to have a compliant housing element. So I also want us to get number credit for the submittal as yeah, well. Okay, yeah. totally fair. And that's what you are planning. That's what. Okay. Yes. Well, you we got it. Thank you. Unless they submit an application sometime soon, then we'd probably switch over to what they're actually proposing as a pipeline. As a pipeline project. Thank you. All right, um, another favorite, SRI Parkline. <laughs> Vice Mayor Wellison, would you like to lead this? Didn't we just take this up and arrive at something uh, as far as the, the units for this? Like, right, I thought. Um, yeah, we I think we did. Um, is the question then, adding units to our pipeline numbers up to, because currently the pipeline is showing 400 units. So is the question being asked is, do we want to count an additional 200 units in the pipeline? This is kind of the reverse of site 38, where this, this is a pipeline project and we're asking the council, do you, wanna, do you wanna think of it more as not a pipeline project and just a housing opportunity site, which is within your discretion. That's the not, delta of those new 200 units or the entire project? I think it's trying to tag into your the recent study session the council had on this property and some of the some of the movements that the applicant was talking about making in, in reaction to the community and or council direction. So yes, I do believe it is would include up to 600 dwelling units on the site. 
which I believe includes an affordable housing, 100% affordable housing proposal, perhaps. For that extra 200 Correct. Units. Well, I believe it'd be a hundred. I think the I, potential idea was a hundred, hundred percent affordable, and then some additional inclusionary, um, maybe like twenty or something off the other hundred or something. I think that was the concept. So that, that so Mayor Nash was saying that might have gone into five eighty three, but they were setting six hundred just to like have a round number or something. We like round numbers. Um, yeah, I think this is really just a question to so like, if the council wants to sort of lean into that movement rather than waiting, because like, like if they were to file, if they were to file a resubmit that officially showed that, then we, as a pipeline project, we could just update it based on that. Doesn't mean the city has to approve it necessarily. Um, but given that we're in this timing situation with getting this public review draft back to HCD soon, um, it might be an opportunity to kind of just preemptively build that into the to the project if, if it's something the council is aware of and supportive of. Council Member Mueller. I just suggest we just leave it alone. Are the applicants working, working with the community, they're working with us in good faith. I think they'll bring it through and we'll get credit for it when they get it done. So I would just, I personally would just leave it alone. That works. Okay. Can I, I, can I ask mayor, I need to backtrack to one item real quick and just change my vote on it. It won't change the outcome, but I, since we talked about the school, it reminded me of an issue with this applicant uh, for the item reference C, the Stanford owned site at Alpine Road in Stowe, I am gonna change myself to a remove from site. And the reason is not because I don't want a project to go forward there, but the reason is because I was reminded when we were talking about schools that Stanford does not pay property taxes. And the only way that we actually achieve, uh, achieve uh, balance in that is through property development agreements with them. So in looking at this project, I actually, would encourage Stanford to bring something forward and say I'm amenable to it, but I don't want to give it to them to just give it to them without having the opportunity. And I do think they'll have pressure from the gov. So I don't expect that to change anyone else's vote, uh, but it but it does change mine. Could you explain that a little bit more? That sounds interesting. Yes, yeah, so when we were doing the uh, the specific plan uh, and Stanford put in all the housing along El Camino Real, uh, because Stanford is an educational institution, they don't have to pay any tax. And so what we ended up having to do with them at that time was we actually negotiated a property development agreement, which where they gave us money. And that's how we got the undercrossing. Uh, and we also, we got a little bit for that and we got it. And then we, so we got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but basically there is no offset when Stanford does development in the city. And we already have one issue where Stanford is buying up homes in the city that we don't get property tax from. In their circumstance, this would be, I'm looking at a 93 unit AHO bonus. So I'm thinking that's great, but I'm thinking well, that's a lot of, that's, that's more property that, that causes uh, more services upon which they don't pay any taxes to us for. And so I would say to Stanford with this site, I, I, I'd remove it from the site list, but I'd say to Stanford, we want you to do something here. We're really interested in doing it with you, pursuant to environmental impacts, uh, but I'm not giving it to you for free. I think they're gonna have uh, housing, uh, housing. Uh, I, think they're, I think when they eventually they do bring their general use permit process forward again, they're gonna have to be looking to places to build housing and knowing that we're interested in doing it here may lead them to wanna do it here, uh, but I just don't wanna give it to them for free, so. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yeah, this is a question for city attorney Doherty. So the pilot agreements. So if it's included in the housing element, does that mean that they, to, to council member Mueller's point that they would not need to enter, they'd have no incentive to enter into a pilot agreement because they would basically have a, like by right, or if we had ministerial approval of 100% affordable, or is there any way to get a pilot agreement on, on that type of a site? There 
there would not be the opportunity to get a pilot agreement on a ministerial project, but not all of these other projects that are potentially contemplated on this particular site would be ministerial ministerially approved. There are limited circumstances in which they'd be ministerially approved. Is ministerial approval one of our affordable incentives that we're looking to explore for 100% affordable housing developments? It definitely is on the on the sites that are being reused or recycled from the fifth element. Um, I'll need a, a, an assistance from Asher Sung to remind us if that's one of the incentives that we're building into the affordable housing overlay zone. Or Deanna. Hi. Thank you. So I, I think it is a, a consideration uh, that has been discussed. It's also a program that would allow for um, once objective design standards are created, uh, we may be able to move towards um, ministerial review for 100% affordable projects. So it was a consideration um, as part of the AH, but uh, um, it's not it's not finaled. Um, also, the Stanford site is a reuse site, and so there's a program that's required by HCD that if, if the city is going to use reuse sites, that they would have to develop um, zone changes that would allow for ministerial if the site um, proposes 20% affordable housing or more. Okay, so to Councilmember Mueller's point, there's a big risk of us not being able to do any kind of agreement with Stanford if we put that in housing element? Because it's a reuse site. Well, and further, it sounds like um, they could do the affordable housing at 20% rather than 100%. Is that correct? As a reuse site, yes. It, as a reuse site, if they propose 20% low income, then they'd be entitled to by right approval. OK, I mean, that's... I, I'm with Council Member Mueller. Let's take it off. Yeah, I although actually, we keep going backwards. <laughs> right, but given that the 20% as well, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Civic Center is the last one of these. Um, Councilmember Taylor, would you like to start us off on this one? Can I pass the baton? Let me look for my notes, Mayor Nash, just a moment. Councilmember Combs is willing to jump in. Sure, I, I mean, my, my stance on this is, is easy because um, I think I expressed it in a meeting not too long ago, but generally I'm, I'm, I'm like opposed. <laughs> so I, I would reaffirm the prior direction to not consider the Civic Center. Councilmember Taylor, did you find your notes? Yes. And I am... I actually have a, a question for, for staff. And, and that is thinking about staff. And this doesn't have to be done um, in this process here, but I just, I'm hoping at some point we can talk about staff housing, um, considering housing costs. Um, and also just to think about our, our vacancy rate and having some type of incentives. So just um, a question that may not be related for this evening, um, but is there possibilities um, in the future to possibly look at the Civic Center as potential um, staff housing? And I, I will add to that, that um, I certainly would be in agreement with that if it's in the 
situation that the building is, the existing building is um, rebuilt, that we at that point include staff housing. Ms. Chow. Thank you. So um, to, to your question, Council Member Taylor, so the, the housing element, even though it's done every eight years, it doesn't preclude the city council from exploring additional housing throughout the eight year planning period. So if that was something that the city council wanted to further explore, um, that, would be, that would be feasible outside of this process, if that was the desire of the city council. Thank you. Uh, that is definitely something I would like to explore um, if in the event the Civic Center um, is redeveloped. I would agree with that, um, that it does not need to be a separate process, but if um, the city starts looking at redeveloping any of the buildings, existing buildings that we would look at including housing in the plans. So for Vice Mayor Wilson. So to clarify, um, Mayor and Council Member Taylor's position, are you saying not to include it in the housing element, but putting a note in the file of any kind of future redevelopment of the Civic Center to consider staff housing? Yes. Um, and that is not to go into green open space. It is not, to, it is strictly to stay within the footprints of the existing buildings if they get redeveloped to look at it at that point. Yeah, I, um, I do not think we should add it now. I think we need to um, really focus our public land attention on the parking lots downtown um, and getting that RFQ, RFP process going as soon as possible since we're relying so much on those sites delivering the bulk of our affordable housing. Um, so I would worry that adding it to the housing element at this time would distract from that process. Um, and so, but I am, this is why when we were talking about the park ordinance that I want to reserve for a future conversation or a future council, um, the ability to redevelop with, with that kind of a thing. So I think I'm in alignment with, uh, with uh, council member Taylor and Mayor Nash on, well, everyone not including in the housing element, but flagging it for future. Thank you. And my understanding is that it would take um, a considerable amount of work to actually include it in this housing um, element because we are unsure of the um, how it was dedicated so that it definitely would not um, fit well with what we're talking about today. Councilmember Mueller or nothing to add. Councilmember Combs, nothing to add. Okay. Um, staff has enough information on that. Thank you. All right. Um, what other topics would you like to discuss as far, while we are on the sites? I'm assuming that we want to discuss downtown parking lots. Um, and then we have the policies. Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. I'm not sure if it's in the staff report, but is there a list of the parking lots? Looking for staff information. I don't have it at my fingertips. Thank you. So. Thank you, Marnesh. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, the parking lots are listed in the, um, let me find the page for you. 
It is on page 7-20 of, of the document. And those um, are listings of the various parking lots, both private and public. And that's PDF page 289. And then individual site sheets are referenced in the appendix um, with the reference numbers that you see on page 7-20. So I will go ahead and just state, um, I think the parking lots are a prime opportunity to build affordable housing and we should um, maximize it. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I, I'm totally in agreement. I, I think we need to move up the conversation about these parking lots. Um, I think, I know this is, about the timeline, which we're not there yet, but I'm here now. Um, I think it said like in the next three years or something, I think we've, we've got to get on this now um, and really open it up to developers to find out, you know, what the possibilities are. Um, Cause this, this is the key to the whole thing. And it's really, it's actually the key to revitalizing our downtown, which is kind of exciting too. So um, I think, I think we, yeah, need to move soon and hard and big. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Mueller. Yeah. Has the council's position changed on building parking garages? The council's, uh, well, I will speak for myself that if it is part of a housing project, absolutely. Okay. It's, I, I have always been for housing incorporating garages. Um, it's getting late. Anyway, yes, housing with garages to replace the parking. All right, because I, I do think that it's going to be, I think it's going to be tricky to include it in the housing element if that, if we're talking about that the condition precedent or a portion of it will be the building of the garages because they're expensive. And so I would, I look to our consultant and the staff to talk about how that works so that we get credit for it because there's a question of whether or not the developer has to do it if the developer has to do it is it truly going to be an affordable project and if the developer isn't going to do it how's the city going to do it and so and that does that require a bond to pass which requires voter approval there's just there's a lot going on there so but i'm uh, if you guys are, I mean, I, you guys know I've wanted a garage for a long time. So if we're talking about a garage with adequate parking, then, then there's a lot of possibility for the downtown. Mr. Bradley. Thank you um, for the question, the opportunity to respond. Um, we're not experts in the mechanics of converting public property into housing and parking garages, but we do look towards recent nearby examples for proof of concept. Uh, downtown Burlingame has done this recently, built a parking garage to replace the parking lost by the conversion of a, a, a separate surface parking lot into 100% affordable housing. San Mateo has done this on an even larger scale, uh, converting uh, two surface lots again into one dedicated to a parking garage and the other lot dedicated to multi-story, multi-family affordable housing with a affordable housing develop, nonprofit housing developer. So we do, we do acknowledge the incredible cost expense of building uh, above and below ground parking structures. Uh, the cost is, is astronomical, um, but the, we, do, we do see it, we do see it happening, happening, but it would require detailed uh, feasibility studies uh, by by experts uh, to make sure the city's interests are protected and that the project can be ultimately successful. 
Thank you. Councilmember Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, so in a general sense, I'm as supportive of, of exploring this. So, so my question to, to staff, and maybe this is something that is, is yet to come, but like, do we feel, or has there been some determination made that the city feels that it has exclusive rights and ownerships to the downtown parking uh, uh, sites uh, to then be able to, to develop them? Or when do we begin that process? Because I remember having lunch some years ago with a downtown property owner who maybe to our benefit is no longer a downtown property owner, but he seemed to um, think that he had some interest in those parking lots based on an assessment district or, or something to that effect um, that, that was used um, in their creation. And so, so my question is, is it like, where are we at with that? Or is that like the first um, thing we're gonna start doing uh, uh, after there is some clear direction from, from, from council that, 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 that we should ex explore that? Uh, let's see, so I, I can take the, the first stab. Uh, uh, my general understanding is the um, uh, city owns the, the majority of the eight parking plazas downtown. There's two that have a combination of private and public ownership. One is uh, the one with the Dragers, which is Plaza 4, and the other is um, Plaza 6 that includes a Wells Fargo. So those are two where it's clear that there are private property owners that own a portion of the public plaza from the uh, person who's parking in, this, in, in the lots. It, it's indistinguishable where the property lines are. So it definitely uh, appears public. But so there's those two lots. So those two parking plazas aside, the city, um, every piece of documentation that we have come across indicates the city owns them but it was acquired through the assessment district. So it's a matter that I think the issue at hand is how the city goes about um, repurposing the lots for non-parking uses in the future. And that's where there's some details that the city will need to work through as part of this process. There may be a difference between if the city wants to actually sell the land versus whether or not the city wants to retain a ground lease. So some of those yeah. mechanics definitely um, need to be uh, worked out. But in terms of actual ownership, all indications are that the, the city owns them and the city has uh, uh, certain rights. And, and so, and, but, but again, you, you mentioned the assessment district that that property owners paid into, correct? Correct. Right. And, yeah. and so have we, is even a part of this process that we're going to go and check with those property owners and see, because it's one thing to say that like every documentation sh shows that like the city owns it and, and can, um, you know, exploit it to the extent it, it thinks appropriate. And again, maybe this is a discussion for a, a, a later time and I know it's late, but, but I do think I, I'll just say that, like, I, I do think that, like, that um, while I'm all about sort of double clicking on, on the parking uh, uh, plazas, I, I don't know that that's going to be as clean a road as we think it is, as we sit here now, um, because it, it only takes one or two property owners or business owners um, that think that they have an interest. Um, and again, we, we can trace that there were monies paid into an assessment district um, uh, to, to acquire, to, to, um, to establish those, those plazas. And so I, I just, I, I think, again, I, I think, you know, getting to the point where we actually feel comfortable that we can, can start engaging uh, uh, developers or create a process by which developers can propose projects to us, I think is, is going to be, um, a lot of work to get there. Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. And, and I agree with Councilmember Combs. And is it possible to just take those two parcels off and look at the six? Uh, let's see. So through the mayor, I, I think the issue, um, and sorry if I wasn't, wasn't um, the issue that I was trying to articulate is actually applicable to all, all eight um, parcels. So the remaining six are, are some of the issues that uh, we, we would face. So um, the, the, the two are probably more complicated, but the other six still have some complications. Thank you. 
Is any direction needed tonight, if we could even do it in a study session to actually proceed with um, looking at these, at the legal uh, options here? I, 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 uh, in this, <laughs> I, I don't believe that there's any additional direction needed at this point in time. Um, and this gets to, down to a practical matter. There's, Thank you, yeah. enough said. <laughs> Okay, other items that um, people are interested in discussing about the sites? Councilmember Combs. Well, one of the public comments, and Ms. Riley, I don't know if you recall, it, mentioned a motel on El Camino. Um, I'm forgetting what- The Red it? Cottage Inn. The Red Cottage Inn. So uh, is that a property you're, you're aware of? I do know that at one point that there was um, a project to, um, uh, to, to redevelop, re redo the, the, um, the hotel, the motel. And I don't know that there's been any movement on that. And so, so I guess my question would be back to you, Mr. Mr. Murphy, like, have, have you also heard this, this rumor that, that the, um, that, 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 that hotel motel site, uh, uh, the owners there, which I know is a local family, um, might be interested in, in housing on that. Ms. Chow. Thank you, Council Member Combs. So we do, um, the Red Cottage Inn currently has an application on file for redevelopment as a hotel. We haven't seen um, movement on that application in some time, but we have not heard that there was interest in uh, a housing, pro a solely housing project on that site. The if I recall correctly, the zoning within the specific plan would already allow for housing at that site. But because it's a there's a current project on the site, we did not identify it as a uh, housing opportunity site. Mr. Bradley. Was that the one that was across from the Guild, the theater? No, that's different. It's a different site. In the 1700 block of El Camino. Councilmember Mueller. I really uh, personally would not want to be incentivizing any hotels to change use because, uh, and maybe it's changed, but I don't think it has. Uh, when you add housing, it typically doesn't bring in as much revenue as it costs. And we use hotel we use hotel tax to offset that in our budget, and so we're adding a lot of housing, and I really don't want to get rid of any of the revenue that's going to be helping to make to balance the city's budget while we're doing it. So, if anything, I'd like to try to figure out how to build some more hotels, or at least protect the ones we have. Thank you. With that, I think let's move into the policy portion and any, actually, first of all, can we take a vote to proceed past 11 o'clock? Uh, okay, looks like we've got a, um, <laughs> a very enthusiastic group. <laughs> um, I guess on the policies, I will just jump in as far as on the downtown specific plan. Um, I'd like to better understand, and I don't have the page in front of me. Um, there was something about minimum residential requirements, and I wanted to better understand that. Um, And essentially what I'm interested in is basically I would like, I am in favor of minimum residential requirements um, generally. And I think that um, downtown next to resources, transit and all is an excellent place to put more housing. Uh, Ms. Chow, please. 
Thank you. So the idea that right now the specific plan does not contain minimum densities. And so sometimes if there's a range between say like zero and, and 40 dwelling in this fee acre, <clears throat> someone could, uh, a potential applicant could come in with a, a 10 unit to the acre project. And what we're really trying to do is uh, maximize uh, our uh, housing production and looking at establishing minimum densities. So providing um, uh, better utilization of the land, especially with uh, square footage. So sometimes we see fewer units with larger sizes. And so potentially establishing a minimum and creating uh, a sort of a, a sliding scale of the square footage as well. So we did something similar with our <clears throat> um, RMU zoning district in the um, Bayfront area where in order to um, utilize your maximum square footage, you needed to increase the density. So those are some of the options that we're looking to explore in the specific plan as well. So one of the, um, I did find it, it's on um, the program H4L. And um, in it, it says, um, establish a minimum density of 20 units per acre to all sub areas upon the addition of residential uses on a site. I have two questions. One is if you could define sub areas. I didn't know, I, I looked and couldn't figure that out. But also um, I'm wondering um, about actually just having it when it's redeveloped as opposed to when residential, residential uses are added. Again, this is for the downtown specific plan area. Thank you. So the, the first question is about sub areas. So that's referencing the different zoning uh, sub areas in the downtown specific plan district. So um, there's like the Southeast, the downtown area, the station adjacent. So there's different sub areas with different development standards. Although we often just refer to it as the downtown, the El Camino, around, El Camino Real downtown specific plan. But in the specific plan itself, there are sub areas with different development standards. So we would be looking to apply the minimum 20 dwellings to the acre across all of the zoning designations. And then the second piece um, in terms of whether it's upon residential redevelopment or upon just redevelopment. So I think that's a question if residential uses will be required as part of future redevelopment of a site. So right now the specific plan allows for residential uses but does not require it. And so if that is something that the city council would like to see we can we can certainly um, explore that and add that to the zoning. But so um, the way that it's suggested now is if they're proposing residential, then it would be at a minimum of 20. But if it's a mandate to have residential as part of future redevelopment, then it would um, we would need to add that language in. <clears throat> so I'm curious what other council members are um, thinking about this. I I would support it. Um, I think that downtown, as has been said, is just um, rich resources and near transit, including near transit, near um, parks, and if we should be able to um, put housing there, and especially since um, I'm interested in housing rather than getting additional um, office, for example. Um, Actually, and I'm sorry, let me step back one. Um, I'm interested in this when redeveloping office, I am not looking um, to displace retail, but I am looking when we have office buildings and um, rather than just strictly getting uh, more office that we add residential to it. So um, that's the clarification. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, we're totally on the same wavelength as you were talking, I was thinking, keep retail, but don't make retail do anything other than retail if, unless they want to add housing. But is there a way, Ms. Chow, to distinguish the language so that if it's office, um, it has to have the residential, but if it's retail, it doesn't? So for clarification, are you looking at existing uses of office or if they redevelop with office, it must contain residential? Uh, I'm just thinking if somebody buys a building downtown and they want to put an office there, we want 
to get, I mean, I'd take housing or residence. I think we don't want more office downtown. We want housing and retail. Yes, that's true. And I guess, but I guess I'm also thinking of some of the larger um, buildings that I think would be called retail, that if they, I would love to see them add office. Um, for example, on the big five site, um, if they were to redesign that, it would be really nice to have office in addition to the retail. Office or housing? I'm sorry, yeah. housing. Okay, it is getting late. Thank you. you. Okay, Please thanks. do correct okay. me when I <laughs> misspeak. Thank you. Council Member Combs, did you want to? Yeah, I would only, um, I, I don't disagree. And I, I thought that with regards to, again, some of the um, what we were aiming to get for with the downtown Pacific plan, as you look at sort of Santa Cruz proper, was this idea of of retail, maybe office, and then a housing. And so, um, and and only based, and I not sort of advocating for for more office, but just based on what I thought was the economics there worked out for 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 some of those lots. And so, um, the extent to which that still plausible um under this then i'm i'm totally supportive of, of like leaning into to, to incentivizing housing yeah i i agree with what uh council member combs is saying I, I do understand the market where sometimes you have to have a little bit of office to have it pencil out i think um ms chow's or, or this whole idea of the minimum housing density and maybe it's some minimum retail density i don't know but the point of you know the the first floor retail, like a second floor office, and then some housing, I think is is the vision that we're going for, or if the housing, if the office isn't needed, but that's that's the concept. And I think it's not something that has to be, it has to contribute to the housing element numbers. It's, some, it's just a general um, policy. Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, I just I know that um, that it's really in vogue right now to complain about housing. I mean, complain complain about office because of the housing office uh, balance. But there's different types of office, and uh, in my time on council, there was a time when we were really concerned, and, and many are still concerned that Class One A office at small. Uh, at small sizes disappeared and made it very difficult for new businesses to start and new uh, and uh, new companies to start in this area and that that's long term going to be a tremendous problem for us so I just um, I think if we're going to be honest about what causes the jobs housing balance it's not some office added to our downtown it's the giant office campuses that are being built and that what we're really trying to achieve in all this is a good mix uh, of, of type. And so um, I do think we need to figure out, and to the extent that downtown hasn't seen uh, housing be built in the specific plan as we expected, or even the retail that we wanted, for years we've been told it's because we don't have the proper parking, require, parking uh, available to make it work. So I just, uh, so I do want to encourage, uh, I do want to encourage obviously housing, but I don't, I don't necessarily think all office is bad. And I do think that it's going to come down to, again, the parking garage and what we do uh, with respect to parking downtown, if we really want to make it all, all, all work correctly. Thank you. Any other comments on the policies? Or programs. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, um, I guess this is the point where I just want to say thank you <laughs> to uh, the public for making public comments, for writing in emails and letters, for the community organizations, for getting people engaged, for everyone who read through the 708 page document and gave their suggestions. I think our earlier conversations about the likelihood of sites developing and the feasibility of these sites actually coming to fruition really um, make the case 
for us meeting the strong policies and programs to complement the site selection that we have. And so um, I know there were a lot of suggestions that came in um, from different community members. Um, I'd particularly want us, and I don't know if this is something that you'll be doing, you know, what type of parking requirements, um, affordable housing incentives, you know, is our 100, you know, an acre AHO, you know, high enough, dare I ask? A ministerial review. I know Ms. Chow said we're considering that, um, potentially increasing other forms of density, um, our BMR guidelines. Um, Midpen talked about the TIA guidelines, which is one of my favorite topics, and about how studying LOS might add to major delay and cost uh, of the environmental. It's not part of the EIR, but it's part of the review process. So whether we want to remove that constraint. Um, a lot of really great ideas came out and um, I just, I'm curious when we get the 90 day review letter back, that'll really be the gut check of kind of how strong that dial will need to be turned. Um, and so I just wanna, I'm hoping that there'll be an opportunity and I'm asking for an opportunity between the return of the 90 day letter and the final submission to HCD that council has another opportunity to look at the feedback we received and then to look again at the policies um, and maybe they'll be more refined by staff and the consultants to see exactly how much we need to push on those. Um, because again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, I'm really nervous about having a compliant housing element and we'll know more after the 90 day review period, but I just want us to be prepared. I don't want us to just wait I'm hoping that staff and, and consultants can spend this time over the next few months, six months, or five months, um, looking at some of these policies and making some recommendations of what's gonna have to complement our sites. And then some of the other policies that were mentioned, not about production, but about um, protection and some of the other P's would be the rental registry idea. Um, I know we've talked about um, short-term rentals um, and how those might be taking housing stock off the out of the marketplace. And if we want to enact any policies like around Airbnb, um, there's been comments about soft stories. Um, we have to obviously be careful about displacing people. I've heard people ask about how do we incentivize more for sale housing units versus rental units. Um, I think we need a mix of all units. I don't know if there's policies, um, levers in the council's control that can do anything with that. Um, so I'm, I'm worried we're racing through the policy section, but I think we might have a little bit of time while um, the document is going to HCD to, to dig a little bit more. Um, and then my last comment about the policies and the programs is just really, firming up some of the language um, and the milestones around implementation, enforcement, um, really um, making sure that we are committed to making them happen. And that kind of goes with the timeline too of, um, and actually with our staffing department, some of the comments about really staffing up our housing department <laughs> and um, making sure, because. Once we submit to HCD, that's really the beginning, then the work comes of actually having to enact all these things. Um, and so we're not gonna be able to do any of it if we're not <laughs> staffed. Um, so those are my thoughts about the policies. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Combs. Yeah, so when uh, whenever we um, we bring up the issue of, of, of sort of counter review or approval or ministerial review, it um, to me brings to mind um, some of my efforts to uh, revise reform the use permit process here. And so I just wanna say that like, if we're getting to a reality where someone who is doing a, you know, a primary bedroom addition on their 4,500 square foot lot has this whole process to go through, including having to go before the planning commission and then someone doing, you know, a hundred unit project does not have to go to the planning commission. Um, I, I think that 
where we're going to be headed for a problem um, in, in terms of unfairness, in terms of the optics. And, and so I just want us to be mindful as we are looking at possible policy levers um, uh, that we don't forget that, that like that we don't create a process where those with um, with the, the most money and, and political capital have the easiest process for engaging um, the city and the resident who, like I said, wants to put on a primary bedroom addition in their, you know, 4,500 uh, square foot lot in the Willows has this, this Herculean process to go through. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yeah, I agree. And I would hope we can make the process easier for everybody because <laughs> hopefully it's not an either or I suppose. I would just um, like to add an interest in the anti-displacement strategy. And of all the items that were brought forward by the um, Joint Planning Commission and Housing Commission study session um, that were on page C1.2 um, of our staff report, the one that really stands out to me is the anti-displacement strategy um, as far as if we can push that ahead. And I know that we've um, got staffing challenges at this point to say the um, and so just to, um, I'll leave it, well, actually the, uh, the one other thing that I'll put forward is the rent protections, um, but realizing that everything's a trade-off. And so we need to make, take that into account. Thank you. Um, may I ask a question? Um, you might not know the answer, but this is following up, it was hours ago, on MPCSD's concern about the language change of the policy of working with the school district. Um, I think I understand why the language was changed, but I, what I don't understand is materially how it's different. Because my sense is our staff and our council and everyone is going to be working with and consulting with the school district. So. Um, maybe it's a question for staff, but materially, how does that changing that language impact how we interact or consider mitigations to the school district? Because I know our hands are tied in a lot of ways about how we're allowed to do that. So I want to be sympathetic to the school district. I also know our charge up here is to make housing development easier. But I, again, at the end of the day, I'm not even sure what the difference is between the two. Yeah, I, I reviewed the existing element and the draft element, and I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint it tonight. Um, if, if there's anyone else on the team that could speak to that. So do you, do you know, Deanna? Uh, not specifically, uh, the intent was not to make any changes, but we heard throughout this process um, from the school district, the importance of planning for the schools and continue that collaboration. So um, our, our intent was not to change anything or to, to reduce the amount of um, collaboration moving forward. Is it possible for someone to reach out um, to the school district and find out exactly what they're discussing? And thank yeah, you. We, we could do that. Thank you. Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, I just have one question that wasn't clear to me tonight. I've been trying to find, I, I confess, I've been trying to look it up, uh, but I just want to make sure, uh, and it's a question that I don't know if you'll have the answer to tonight, but I'd like it brought back to us before final. And that's that when we up zone, when we go to a church and we take part of their property and up zone it to residential, does that affect their property tax uh, exemptions? because assumably that property on their church would not be being used for a religious purpose. And so that's now become marketable property for real estate. So I wanna know what the tax implications are to those entities and whether or not we're hitting them with the tax bill. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Taylor, did you have any comments? 
Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. I, I have a question on page um, C1.69, um, and that is, this is the timeline where items will be implemented. Is there still opportunity, um, not this evening, to move things around? I don't want to add anything. It's just instead of having number one be one, I'd rather have three be number one. Is there opportunity to do that um, during the 90-day review or after? Or would that have to be this evening? Uh, we could we could do it now. Um, we could make changes during or after the 90 day review. We just have to be careful that um, we didn't make something slower that HCD had already seen as going mm -hmm. faster. Should be be better if it was in the other direction. Oh, oh, that makes sense. And I'm um, right. go ahead. And having having said that out loud, now it may be more productive for the council to, to see the feedback you get from HCD because they may they may be even more aggressive than where the council's at. So rather than changing everything twice, we could wait to see where they think the trigger points are and see where that lines up with your with your viewpoint. Thank you. Not seeing any more comments up here. What um, additional information, if any, does staff need to keep going? Um, and thank you so much to all staff members for all of the incredible work that's gone into this and it's and sticking with us tonight and the other all the other meetings. Thank you. So is there something additional that is needed? Anything else, Deanna or Sung, that um, you wanted to get covered that we didn't we didn't get a chance to? I think we've uh, addressed the the primary issues that we wanted to identify that we've heard the most feedback on with respect to the sites and the policy and programs. Um, so thank you for sticking with us and members of the public here this evening. Um, and I know that this is a, a continuing dialogue. So, um, in terms of next steps, we can we can talk through that if if that is um, in the council's interest. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Is there anything additional on this portion that you need? Um, I believe I am clear on the direction, the discussion and the clarification received tonight on the study session. Um, and Ms. Chowers, are there next steps that you were going to do tonight? Thanks, so yes, just to reiterate, so we have our public comment review period ending this Friday. And so we do encourage, um, members of the public who have not provided their um, comments already or provided comments this evening to please provide that. We do have a web form on the um, on the city's website for the housing element on the park.org slash housing element. Uh, following um, the close of the period, uh, staff and the applicant or staff and the consulting team will be preparing a revised draft based upon comments that we've heard this evening, the feedback that we received and um, submitting that to HCD for its 90 day period. Uh, during that time, we'll be continuing to refine not only this document, but we do have other components of the housing element that we do plan to bring forward um, with respect to the environmental, just draft, environmental justice element and safety element, and then also the release of our uh, subsequent EIR. So there are a number of things that are gonna be happening during this 90 day period. Um, and we'll we'll keep uh, the city council informed, members of the public informed. We'll be updating our webpage with um, upcoming meeting dates, and and so um, yes, we have we have a, a number of things that we'll be focused on with the intent of bringing back. Um, and we heard this evening 
uh, an opportunity to bring back documents after we receive our, our letter from HCD um, and we can continue the conversation if any additional modifications are needed. Thank you so much. And please um, thank staff again for all they're doing. Ms. Taylor, uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. When I, I made a comment uh, a few moments ago, I did not um, say that I support uh, having a anti-displacement strategy come to the council or come sooner um, as a program. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we are going to um, continue items um, D1 and D2, and we will proceed with closed session for D3. Um, City Clerk Karen, could you please call for public comment on closed session item D3? Yes, and um, actually, if I may just check in with our city attorney, can I open public comment for all three items if they were all agendized, or am I only taking it on D3? You can do for all of them. That's Thank fine. you. Perfect. Okay. So if any member of the public wishes to speak on our closed session items, D1, closed session for public employment title city manager, item D2, public employment evaluation for interim city manager, or item D3, public employment evaluation of the city attorney, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. Final call for public comment on our closed session items, D1 through D3. And our first speaker will be Pamela Jones. And Pam, if you could let me know uh, which item you are speaking on, that would be super helpful, thanks. Uh, yes, thank you, um, city attorney. And um, the reason that, I, that I'm speaking on this one is I don't, um, I would like to have the same process of the same information with our previous attorney that is being required publicly now on our current attorney. Um, and I'm not sure if, if that means I need to do a public um, records request. I, you know, I don't know how to proceed on that. But since the topic is now up, um, I think we need to look over the last, actually probably the last um, 12 years. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on our information items D1 through D3. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash may continue. Thank you. The city council re will report out any action from tonight's closed session at the June 14th city council meeting. And with that, we will adjourn. Thank you.